Hello, everyone. Welcome to another episode of The Person You Want to Be. I am your host, Eric Teplitz. Today, it is my honor and great pleasure to have with me as my guest on the podcast, Danny Miranda. In September of 2020, at the age of 25, Danny published episode one of a long form interview podcast called simply the Danny Miranda podcast. 34 months later, the Danny Miranda podcast reached the milestone of 1 million plays, including downloads and YouTube views. It is in the top 1% of all podcasts in the world in terms of its reach. And as of this recording date, he has released a staggering 414 episodes. Danny interviews some of the world's greatest entrepreneurs and thinkers on his show, and he has recently released a course called Art of Interviewing for those who wish to learn from his experience about how to attract guests, do research, and conduct the highest quality interviews possible. Danny Miranda, welcome to the person you want to be. I am honored to be here, especially after that wonderful introduction. I really appreciate it, you summarizing my life in a paragraph or two, and I'm I'm grateful for the opportunity to be here today. Thank you, man. I really appreciate it. You're so welcome. And that number of 414, when I first reached out to you, I I really I jokingly said, I don't know if you're an AI or you know if you're truly in the flesh because you know i i couldn't even wrap my brain around that many podcasts in 3 years time and you know the number is one thing the consistency and and the output is one thing in terms of quantity but that really wouldn't mean much of anything to me personally if it was at the expense of quality if it was just you know just kind of drivel just random, like blathering about nothing. Your podcast is the opposite of that. Your podcast, your interviews are so thoughtful, deep, penetrating. The The variety and, and quality of your guests is mind-blowing to me. So I just want, as a newbie compared to you, I want to just salute you for what I see as a re remarkable job that you've done thus far. Thank you. I, I really appreciate that. I tried to put out as much as I possibly can. And I've tried to do that without taking away any of the quality. And I found a nice rhythm and treadmill. Mm -hmm. um, I feel like I'm on a treadmill, but on a treadmill of my choosing and that I enjoy being on. And I'm um, just keeping up the pace. The more yeah. you do, the easier it gets. I love that. And it is a, it is an astounding pace. I just want to reflect that back to you because I know that when you're in the weeds with something and it's become your norm, you might not realize what you've what you've actually done because you're always focused on what you're doing now and what you're doing, what's coming next. So I just want to acknowledge that and honor that. So um, the way that I like to start all of these interviews is by asking, in this case, you, Danny, <laughs> what is your earliest memory, the earliest sense? that you had or can recall of what it was you wanted to do, who it was you wanted to be, what you were naturally magnetized to, drawn to, obsessed with, or just delighted by, any or all of those things. And if, if you have memories pre-sunny times in regard to this, that's that's really what I'm what I'm digging for. Oh, sunny times is going to be my answer, and I'm happy to <laughs> <laughs> you beat me to it. Um, I I can't recall an earlier memory of of what I felt called to do before six years old. And when I was six, I I turned to my friend. And I said, "Hey." I saw my parents reading something called the New York Times. I think we can do something to take that over. And so I created the Sunny Times, which you referred to. 
And if I really try to think before six, I don't know if I can come up with anything. I'm sure there were signs and I would have to interview my grandparents and mm. parents to really understand deeper level who I was from zero to five. But to me, that w- that's the clearest indication of, of creating media and building media. So that's all I got, unfortunately. Wish I had some other earth shattering insight That's, for no, you. No, I mean, hey, who who even has uh, a revelation at so young an age as that? Uh, and even though it's sort of like a tongue in cheek and uh, endearing and sort of cute story, well, I'd like to know what, if you even recall, what was it about seeing your parents reading the New York Times that left an impression on you to even have a desire to, you know, was it like just getting, you know, getting their attention and eyeballs on something? Was it what do you remember at all? (laughs) It wasn't from it wasn't from the place of if if I do this, then they'll love me. It wasn't that it was not that because my parents loved me and I felt their attention. It was more so the thought of like, oh, someone created this thing, the New York Times. Why can't I? And so if someone else could do it, then I could do it, too. And it's funny how like the world has become more like that than ever before of like, oh, Tim Ferriss has a podcast. I can create a podcast too, right? And he inspired me to help do the show the way that I do. And so although I'm no Tim Ferriss, I, I've i used him as a model for, in some sense, creating a podcast that's high quality and that's really focused on the other person to give them a new understanding of who they are. And I think the more and more we see people who inspire us, the more and more we look at them and say, Oh, I could do that too. That is where all the juice of life is found. I look at LeBron James and I'm saying to myself, I could never do that. That is that is outside my scope of what is possible based on my limitations of physical. But there are people who who look at LeBron James and say, I'm 6'6". I, I can shoot the ball really well. I can dribble hard to the paint. And then they actually use that as the example of like, oh, so I think it's like looking at people who have common attributes and attributes that you admire that you actually could live into. And be more of that. That's kind of how I've framed it. Yeah. So you can, they serve as inspiring ex- examples, but they're not so far beyond and above us. We can connect or relate on some level that suddenly makes it seem possible for us. Yes, absolutely. And to me at the time when I was six, it was, I saw pieces of word. I saw words on pieces of paper and I was like, I can put words on pieces of paper. Why not? And so that's kind of how my thought process was at in kindergarten or first grade. Right. Did you take any action on that idea? Did you actually like put something together, you know, called the sunny times? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, it, it, it was, it was out there for, I think it was like a, um, I think I did like three or four issues at least. And I think they were seasonal if I remember correctly, mm. like it was like the spring issue, the summer issue. The, you know, I should have taken the cadence from the New York Times and realized that they were doing it daily. <laughs> you and would, so, you would get there. <laughs> yeah. So I think that's also an important point to notice is like, okay, look at the person who is doing the thing that you want to be done and then ask how many times did they do it? For me, with this pursuit, I knew that Joe Rogan had done the podcast three times a week for 10 years. And so I said, if I want to be to that level, I need to put in the same amount of work. So I'm going to put out three episodes a week for 10 years and see how that plays out. And I've I've dipped through that from time to time. Like in the second year of the podcast, I was doing two episodes a week instead of three. But then you get back on the cadence and it's just like, that is the new normal. That is the what we do because that is where we would like to go, right? We would like to be one of the most listened to podcasts in the world, but not because it's amazing to be listened by that many people, but just because like, it would fill me with joy to do that. And it excites me, the possibility. And yeah, I think like in order to become all I can be, I need to put in the same amount of work as the people who I admire. So that's kind of an important thing to look at when starting your own pursuit. I love that. And it's not lost on me that your name for this um, publication or periodical was the Sunny Times, because I think anyone who has even listened this far can just feel the optimism exuding from you you have you have a a really infectious enthusiasm for life it comes across in every thing that i've seen you do every episode i've watched or listened to 
you just have, and it's, it's genuine. And for someone like me, so I'm a, I'm a Gen Xer and, you know, our generation, the cliche of our generation is this sort of cynicism, you know, and uh, whatever, like everything's, you know, uh, and you're the opposite of that, but, but in a way that is, feels so genuine that I think it would get anyone in touch with their inner idealist and, um, it, you know, there's nothing pretentious or there's nothing like artificial about the energy that you put out. It just feels genuine and sincere. And so it, it, it touched me right away. Uh, the sunny times, you're the guy. I, I yeah. <laughs> um, cool. So I know that sort of the next sort of milestone, uh, in your media life, as it were, was a blog that you published. You started at the age of 13 and you were inspired by Gary Vaynerchuk, correct? Yes, and sir. The time management blog. So first of all, at 13, were you an avid reader already? How did Gary V uh, come onto your radar? What You've said that you've always been interested in media and communication, but I'm interested as to what that looked like as a preteen. So as a preteen, the, the real next thing that I did was at 12 years old, I had a Little League blog, which I, I haven't talked about a lot. And the Little League blog was basically like, I would I would play in the games and then I would write a report after the game on a blog that I would host that all my teammates loved and all their parents loved because it was like they were getting professional coverage as a 12 year old. Huh. And so that to me was so exciting that it was bringing them, everyone on my team and their parents so much joy that I was like, this is great. And uh, that was kind of like, another sprinkle of media that just came so naturally to me. It wasn't like anyone was telling me I had to do this. It was just like, yeah, we're playing in a game. Let's let's write about what happened after the game because I feel like that would be interesting to to have and to see the box score. So that was kind of the next thing that I did. And then after that, I was like, what I'm doing is is beyond baseball, you know, and I I don't I don't really resonate. I didn't play baseball after 12 years old. And so I was like, what can I do bigger than baseball? Well, for me, it was like, let me go back to the sunny times and the the energy that I got from just teaching people about like optimism and light and energy and and managing your time. And um, yeah, that that was that was the next project that I did. And that was that was to me, that filled me with so much joy to be able to write and learn about how I stumbled across Gary Vee was because I asked myself. I have this blog. How do I get more people to see this blog? Mm. And who are the best people who are helping other people see other things? Meaning who are the best marketers? And mm. Gary Vaynerchuk was one of the best marketers at the time because he was started a wine library TV show, a YouTube channel, which was him documenting his reviews of different wines. And it had gotten pretty popular. And people were already looking at him at that time. It's like, this guy knows the internet and this guy knows how to get attention to things. And so I wrote a blog post about him also commenting on his energy and his love for life. And like you doubting it, not, not like you, like your generation of people being like, what is, I don't believe that this is true. Like, well, how could he have this much energy? How does he have this much love for life? I don't know if it's, if, if I should believe him or not, but uh, it's been cool because for a long time I felt how does how does someone like Gary Vaynerchuk exist with so much self awareness, kindness, humility, willingness to get better? Like, I'm not that, and I wish I was. And meditation got me to that point and helped me understand myself, which is I know fast forwarding the story, but yeah, I mean that that was the journey of time management blog and and I saw something in him, I saw the light in him in Gary V, but I didn't know how he had it exactly. Hmm. How how much awareness did you have? How did you become aware of the blogosphere? It was fairly new at that point. So, what blogs were are you know did, were you aware of that that even gave you the idea to start a time management blog? Yeah, that's a good question that I don't recall the answer to off the top of my head. But I know problogger.com with Darren Rouse was big and pivotal for me. That was one of the first books I bought. And I really respected him as a blogger. And I was like, I could be a pro blogger, meaning I could be a pro at this thing that I was doing with my Little League team. Like, that is so cool to me. And then I started to um, like do this blog for a few months. And then what happened was this woman said, there's no way this kid is 13. 
And if he's 13, he shouldn't be on the internet. What's he doing on this internet at 13 years old? Because I'm posting things that are are so adult like content and so personal to me that like I feel uncomfortable that a 13 year old is in the space or like blogging at all. And so that was very discouraging for me of being like, maybe she's right. Maybe I should just stop posting and maybe I should be a normal kid. So yeah, that was that was a whole journey in and of itself. That woman was this like a random commenter commenter online? Yes. Random commenter online. And you did you take it pretty personally at that point? Definitely. Definitely. Wow. I took it personally and I took it like um like maybe she's right. Maybe I'm maybe I'm not supposed to be doing this at this time. Like I found a thing that works for me. But hmm. is this like am I I can come back to this at any time. Like, why do I need to do this right now in this moment? So I kind of, I bought into her frame of reality. Wow. That's, and is that what, why you stopped? Yes. Wow. I mean, I, I can't, that if I, if I had not read that her say that I probably would have continued, hmm. but at the same time, that comment was going to happen at some point. So it, whether it was three months in or six months in, if that was the thing that was going to break me, it would have happened eventually. So it wasn't meant to be in that scenario. That's a that's a very um, mature and probably pretty accurate assessment that you couldn't have made until later, right? But it's true that if that was enough to stop you, maybe also you didn't have enough momentum yet. If you had been doing it for a full year, Maybe it wouldn't have, um, you know, caused as much doubt, but, you know, these are all speculations that, you know, it's, they're only really interesting in hindsight to see how they've informed our journey. Um, so you weren't, you weren't held back for too long because then at age 15, you started Nick's vision. Tell me about the impulse behind that. Nick's vision came to be because I looked at my email inbox and I said, how come no one's emailing me? There were days, <laughs> <laughs> there were days in the, in the commander time days where I would just open my email inbox and people would be emailing me stuff about positivity, about time management, about life. And I was like, this is amazing. And you get the comments too. And it was, it was so incredible to be communicating with people in that way. And I guess at 15, I realized like, that had gone away and that it was summer break. And I was like, I, I miss that, that interaction with people and that feeling of being useful to people. Hmm. And so I knew that LeBron James was making his decision. It's funny that I brought up LeBron and this is an important thing. LeBron James making his decision for where to play in 2010. He had played all of his career on the Cavaliers in Cleveland. And I knew one of the options that he was deciding was between the Knicks, the Heat, and maybe the Lakers at the time. And I said, okay, if I start a Knicks blog and he comes to the Knicks, the value of the blog is going to increase tremendously and more readers are going to come to it. And I know even if LeBron isn't going to the Knicks, I know the Knicks are going to be involved and they're going to be a better basketball team very soon. So let me take this opportunity and start writing about them. So I start using all the skills that I had I learned from starting the previous blog mm. and very quickly it started gaining traction. I, one key thing that I don't know if I've shared before online, but one key thing that I did was I interviewed a bunch of the reporters of the Knicks at the time and doing those interviews allowed me to get involved and entrenched in the Knicks media ecosystem. And it, it gave people, the writers of the team, a chance to share my own blog. So I was covering the team, but I was also writing and doing interviews with the reporters that were written interviews. The, the blog gave, got enough traction in the first three months of it where I sent an invite to the Knicks PR department. And I said, hey, this is my blog. And I would love to come to media day to interview the NBA players. And they said, this is amazing. Of course. Sure. I see you have this amount of people watching or, or reading your, your work. Come, come on down to, to media day in Westchester. My mom, God bless her, she she drove me. My dad said, I don't know, this like he should stay in school. He should be in school. My mom was like, 
are you kidding me? He's going to interview a bunch of NBA players. I'm driving him. So my mom drove me, which is very kind of her. And I thank to this day that she did that. I show up to media day. They're like, who, who are you? I said, I'm nixvision.com. And they're like, oh my God, you're, you're 15. You look like you're 12. <laughs> <laughs> like I'm 28 now. And I probably look like I'm 21. And it's like, they were just so in shock. I mean, the NBA players were like, what are you doing? You should be in like in a funny joking way. Like, why aren't you in school? Like what's going on? But to me, it was a pivotal moment of my life mm. because the New York daily news wrote about me as well. Frank Isola, incredible guy, sent me a, a message in the past year. Like great work on the, the podcast, like keep it up. And the blog, the, no, he sent me a, Oh, on, on your podcast. On the podcast. So, so he's still in, he's still in your uh, circle there. In some way, that was the oh, first wow. communication I had with him. He wrote the blog post about me in when I was 15 in 2010. And then he he circled back to send me a message congratulating me about the podcast. Oh, how about that? That's incredible. So that that was that whole thing, I mean, was so pivotal because I covered the team for the next year and a half. It gave me incredible experience on learning about how to how to write, how to cover sports, how to interview people that I still use to this day. And it, it to me was a foundational, foundational experience. But at some point I said to myself, I want to be a normal kid. You know, I, I knew I had this gift, this talent, because I looked around at media day and I'm seeing no other 15 year old kids. So, you know, at some point you're special in some way because you don't, you don't see anyone else like you. But I also said, I just want to be normal. I just want to go to parties. I want to be with girls. I want to, you know, like I, I just want normal friends. And so I guess from 16 or 17 to 23, 24, 25, I like shut off that part of myself mm. in, in some sense, because I just wanted to be normal. And I knew that those were my years to be normal because I knew you can only be a late teenager once. You can only be in your twenties, early twenties once. And I was like, let me live that experience so that what I, whatever I do, I know I'm going to excel at and put my heart into and do the same things that I did when I was 15. But let me just live life normally for a little bit. So I don't mean to skip ahead too much on your, your story, but I, I think it's important to say, like, I knew I had a gift. I knew I had something different about me, but I also knew I didn't want to live in it. I didn't want the responsibility of it maybe. Mm. And just for some context, you grew up on Long Island, correct? Yes, sir. So were you a Knicks fan from a, a young age? Yeah, since as as little as I can remember. Yeah. Yeah. Um so that's yeah, that's I think that's a, a tension that almost anyone can relate to, the the tension to fit in, the tension to want to be quote unquote normal. And um I think it's a really interesting thing to observe in yourself, whatever your age, is to just kind of notice if and when you are experiencing that and and then to to just sort of observe it at the very least and just be aware of it because so much of what so many people do with the majority of their conscious hours during the day is on autopilot and doing what they believe is expected without even questioning it without even you know and even if it causes great internal for some people maybe that's they're no they have no issue with it but i think for a lot of people and anyone listening to this podcast most likely uh, that doesn't feel great inside. There's this feeling of if you're if you're not living in alignment with what is true for you, and you're just if you're just you know uh, conforming so that you can go along to get along kind of thing, that is going to create some uh, unease, maybe even dis-ease in in people. And just just so just to just to as a seed to plant, you know, just something to be aware of. It can happen to anyone in any stage of their life. And uh, it's interesting because in your case, you know, it was a decision that you made and it sounds like fairly consciously uh, you really wanted the the feeling of, you know, normalcy. Um, and obviously things did change for you uh, at some point, but I want to get into the decision that you made for college. So I know you went to Binghamton. What What thought or lack thereof did you put into that decision? What went into that? So originally I went to Colgate for a year and a half and I transferred to Binghamton. But the the thought behind both of those decisions was how do I have the most fun possible? <laughs> okay. 
And the fun had nothing to do with learning. Yeah. And it it was a conscious decision to be unconscious. Wow. It was like, I don't want to think about my gifts. I don't want to think about my purpose on life. I, I cannot handle the responsibility of what that would mean. So I'm I'm going to I'm going to party. I'm going to, you know, disrespect my body. Like I'm not going to, I'm going to disrespect my mind by not like putting in things in it that are going to be positive and beneficial. And I'm going to go with that program. And, and I did, you know, and, and looking back, you can, you can make the argument like that. That's wasted time. I, I choose to view it as like, that is, that is time that I met some incredible people who, some of which I'm friends with today. And, but it was it was characterized because I could not I I did not want to take responsibility for who I was and who I was capable of becoming. And you know, people saw in me like the potential. Like I, I remember my college roommate my freshman year was just like, dude, you could you could get straight A's if you wanted. And I was like, Yeah, but I know I it was also like resentment. Like I, I resentment for my parents for expecting me to go to college, uh, because I knew that I didn't need it because I was 15 years old and interviewing <laughs> NBA players. So if you're 15 years old interviewing NBA players, and the purpose of the degree is to hopefully get you a job that could one day interview NBA players, you're sitting there like, what are we doing here? And and so that tension for me was so difficult. But I also like wanted to be normal in some sense. Hmm. So it was like. I just kind of went with that program because it was the easiest thing to do. And I knew that fighting it would have caused resistance in my parents in that moment and resistance with my family. And I was just like, I don't want to deal with that. So it that's kind of explains my decision, I guess, to the best of my abilities of what I what those years represent. Did you see it at the time? when you were partying in college, did you see it then as disrespecting your body and disrespecting your mind? Or did you, did you only, do you only frame it that way in hindsight? It's a good question. The question is like, how aware was I? <laughs> um, I don't know. I don't know is the, the actual answer. I'd have to like review journal entries or, or were really... you journaling that far back? No, I don't think so. But I, I'm sure I was typing things in my notes. And I'm sure if I reviewed the photos of that time, I could mm. get myself into the mind state, which is a great tool I think people can can think about in the modern world where everything is documented. It's like scroll back on your old Facebook photos, scroll back on your own old um, notes in your phone or, or just photos, because I somehow can get into that frame of mind pretty easily if I just review the photos of those experiences. Yeah, that's fascinating. And I think that people are different in in what jogs and what jogs their memory or evokes things for them. Some people are extremely visually oriented. Yeah. Um, I'm not, <laughs> but my wife is. And I pointed it out to her fairly early on um, in our relationship. And and it she wasn't really even aware of it. I just noticed it because it was such a contrast to, to myself. Um, so th that's a really good point. And it, it, it brings up a question I want to ask you about social media. All right. Um, social media is, it's easy to have an ambivalent relationship with it. Um, especially for someone who's aspiring to be conscious about the use of their time and, and their, where they put, where they, where they're putting their attention because social media um, I mean, do we really even need to say it, right? Like it's, it's, uh, you know, you can check an app and then three hours later, what happened to my life? Like, where is it? Like, <laughs> you know, right. Um, so, but at the same time you have said, I'm going to find the quote because it, um, it was really, uh, impactful when I read it, you said, I meet all my best friends from Twitter. And the way I took that, correct me if I'm wrong, was you weren't just speaking about online friends, but actual like in real life friends, friendships that you've built and cultivated. So tell me if you would about the arc of your relationship with social media. 
uh, I would just love to hear what you have to say about that. So I believe that whenever something is new that comes about in the world, there is going to be an equal amount of people who fight against it and tell you and explain to you all the reasons why that thing that is new is bad and bad for you and bad for your health and bad for your mind and bad for everything. And I hear that. There are definitely a lot of criticisms with social media. I also feel like this is connecting with human beings. And every time I've connected with human beings, I've gotten more from life. And uh, it's become more of an enjoyable experience. And I've gained consciousness and I've gained increased awareness and I've met people. So to me, you can replace social media with connecting with human beings and try to look at all the, the negatives of connecting with human beings. Like there are negatives, but there aren't as many as when you replace it. So I've met all my best friends through social media. I've met all my best friends through Twitter. The reason being for that is you understand me better by listening to my podcasts than perhaps you would if you just was my friend in high school. You get a deeper sense of who I am, what I care about. Same thing with Twitter and the things that I put out on there. And I think in a world that wants to demonize social media, the, a world that wants to demonize screen time, I'm like, I don't judge myself for that at all. It's given me so much good and so much of of joy that that has occurred in my life is a result of social media. So how could I be mad at that? And when I waste an hour, I don't view that as wasting an hour. I view that as how many people did I connect with? How much knowledge did I gain? And maybe that's just my optimistic nature, but I really think it's it's a more fuller perspective than what how most people think about social media. Yeah, and maybe most people older than yourself, because <laughs> I'm sure there is a, a a generational difference in view in the way you know it's viewed, and it's it's a it's something that I personally have a lot of ambivalence about because I do see the value of it, and I have benefited from it, but I really have kept it at a distance, and uh, because I value my time so much, and it feels like the the signal to noise ratio is on balance for me, not worth it, but it's also possible that I'm just not using it skillfully. And, yeah. and it sounds like you use it pr quite skillfully. Yeah, I, I think I do. I really think I, I use it really skillfully. One useful tactic for Twitter is to mute words that are make you upset or words that like don't serve your purpose or goal. Like I know I've blocked, I've muted the word Republican, Democrat, uh, like all the is like racist or whatever, like huh. I've, I've muted that. And that has made for my experience so much sweeter and helped me a lot on Twitter. And that's just like one little thing. You can search how to mute words on Twitter and that will come up, I'm sure with instructions. Yeah. So not surprisingly to me, you've been very conscious about how you've cultivated your, your social media universe. Mm -hmm. and, and, and curated it. That's the word I meant. I was looking for curated it. Um, okay. So you had this mindset of partying in college and you did that. What, what was your major at Binghamton? Political science. Okay. And w was there any intentionality behind that? What was no. the thought? <laughs> <laughs> Where what did, did it you... come from? Uh, I asked myself, what is the easiest thing that I can do? Uh, Wow. And, and yeah, so it gives you a sense for where my mind was at. I looking back on it and senior year of college, when I started to understand myself a little bit better, I realized, oh, I should have definitely majored in psychology. Like that would have been a lot more in alignment with who I am and what I care about. But it wasn't until like the last semester did I realize that. So yeah, I think it's incredibly difficult if all you've ever known is school to enter college at 18 and make the most of it uh because you how you know we don't get trained in self-awareness in school i mean it seems like there's just almost anything that is truly useful in the world and in life is not taught in school i mean that's an a, an overstatement but maybe just by a bit <laughs> right so the point being that who knows themselves well enough and how could you if if you haven't really experienced much outside of school to um i know i did not 
have the tools to take full advantage of college while I was in it. And, you know, you're just, it's, it's, but like, as to your point, it's not wasted time. It's all, all experiences learning. And one of my favorite quotes ever is this, I know you'll appreciate it. Nothing bad ever happens to a writer. It's all material. I love that. And I know that you're interested in writing and I'd, I'd love to hear about the genesis of that and and how that has evolved over the course of your life. Yeah. I mean, I, I always viewed myself as a writer before a podcaster. I, I started writing when I was doing the sunny times. I started, <laughs> I felt always felt so much more comfortable writing than I did putting video or audio out of myself. And part of that is like the separation between your thoughts and, and you and part of that is like, I always admired writers like more than any other profession for their thoughtfulness. And and it's true. Like if you are a writer or if you are a creator of any kind, the things that happen are just there for your benefit. And really that that is a remarkable thing. It's true for musicians. It's true for comedians. It's true for anybody who's creating something. The negative things are actually things that they can use in a song, in a joke, in a podcast. And that is such a beautiful part of life. That's the mm. beautiful part about being a creator is you can take the negative and make it positive and make it into something that helps people in some way. So you can yeah. be an alchemist. Yeah. What were you reading growing up? You mentioned that writers were the people you admired the most. I, I read a bunch of fiction, uh, like Lemony Snicket is a name that comes to mind is like a fiction series. A uh, Harry Potter was foundational to me. Um, I started getting into nonfiction. I think around like 13, 14, I started reading the game by Neil Strauss that comes to mind. Um, I read a lot of psychology, like psychology books at that age. Yeah. Hmm. Um, I, I can't, recall exactly which ones impacted me or but i always interested in like business i like business marketing psychology mind mindset all of that stuff at a very early age like i'm writing the sunny time i'm writing command your time at 13 so it was that yeah. sort of stuff that was i was reading as well i've heard you say many times that you you have an incredibly supportive family and that they've been encouraging and supportive of you through throughout your life. And what a beautiful thing. So, uh, you know, hats off again to the Mirandas, as I've heard other people say on your podcast. Um, so what specifically did your parents do to make you feel supported and encouraged? And did they at any point attempt to nurture seeds that they saw in you or at least make you aware of them as potential like strengths or or talents yeah so when i was 16 i don't think i've ever told the story so hats off to you for sparking <laughs> you when i was 16 i i wanted to support the Knicks blog that i created and the way i did that was by writing and and covering local sports teams and it was like fifty dollars per game is what i would get for covering a local sports team and it was patch is like i don't know if they still have them but it it was the the local patch meaning like the local newspaper when you for, say local local sports team what are you referring to like minor league or or, or high, like high school, school. Or, okay, high school okay. yeah yeah thank you so the high school team and the high school teams I would cover and then I would I would get money for that. And so I, I started to do this a lot and I put out a lot of articles. And my I, part of writing the articles was also taking photos of the game so that people could get a sense for what it was about. And I remember my dad buying me a, a new camera that was like at the time really impactful. And he he just like stoked my curiosity in terms of like photography. And the funny thing about this is when I was, <laughs> this is crazy. 
<laughs> so my dad, well, I was getting paid $50 an article and everyone else was getting paid $100 an article because I was 16 years old and I was a minor. So my dad was basically like, hey, my son should be making $100. And, and he was saying that to me. And so I sent them a message and then he sent them a message saying that I should be paid a fair wage that everyone else was making because it's clearly just as good. And I guess this got passed up the hierarchy from my editor to the person above to the person at AOL because Patch AOL mm-hmm. owned Patch. And they were basically like, what the hell is a 16-year-old doing writing games and reports? Why is he on the payroll? We got to fire him. <laughs> so my dad, you know, trying to help me and trying to support my passion by getting me this camera, then goes out and <laughs> I can't can't use the camera. I get fired. So that was a whole whole situation in and of itself. But what I took from that was one, my dad got me this camera to help me. And two, he was willing to support me and being like, you should get paid more. So those I usually talk about the examples and the help of my mom and how much she's helped me. But those are examples for my dad and how he stoked the curiosity in me. And I remember asking my dad one time, like, this is maybe before or after, I can't remember. I asked him like, if he wasn't, if he wasn't an attorney, what would he do instead? And he said, the sports journalist was something he would do. So it's very much, I guess, in my nature, in my blood to do something like that. So AOL saw you as a liability because you weren't like legal to work. Is that? <laughs> That's it's, it. a, it's a great story. Thank you for sharing it. It's a great story because, and it also is a reminder that, you know, it, it's to distinguish between intention and result. You know, we, we don't know the effect of the things what the effects are going to be of the things that we have and the things that we put out there. Uh, we don't, we don't have any control over that, how it's taken, but hopefully if we come from a place of good intention and if the recipients of our actions um, can, can see that in us and that we're consistent in, you know, that we, we, we've built up enough goodwill that people give us the benefit of the doubt because they understand you know, where it's coming from. I mean, that's just a very general uh, statement, but it is inter- It is interesting to note how, you know, the best laid plans, right, of mice and men. Um, and uh, it's a sweet story. Thank you for sharing it. Uh, so you finish college in 2018 at uh, Binghamton, right? You've got your degree mm-hmm. in political science. A um, couple questions here. Were there any expectations of you from your parents or otherwise at that point? And the second question would be um, to just, if you would, tell me about Carpe Diem. DM. <laughs> yes, I love that. <laughs> so epic. Oh, you're the best, man. This is this is great. I love this interview so much. <laughs> um, one, there were no expectations from my parents. I feel like I'd given them, um, you know, college and going to college, even though sometimes I would fight it like just with them and fight it in general by not giving my best. Mm -hmm. And they understood that. So I feel like they felt like I did them a favor in some sense by doing the thing that I didn't want to do. And so afterwards, I felt from them and from myself, like our debt is paid here. Like we did it. We did the (laughs) thing. Like we're done. (laughs) I can relate personally. Um, and then, uh, like what I expected of myself was, I don't want to work for someone. I want to build my own thing in some sense. And I'm going to figure out how to do that. And I'm not, I'm not going to work for anyone because it's, it's against my nature. And I've shown that I can do that Mm -hmm. with my previous ventures. So, um, Carpe Diem, I can't remember if that was 2018 or 2019, uh, according, according to my notes, <laughs> June 29th, 2018 was when you um, had the like, you know, idea and you were generating yes. like ideas for posts or first of all, well, explain Carpe DM. Yes. Yeah. yeah. So Carpe DM was seize the day, but my initials DM. And the reason why this frustrates me that I had this idea in June of 2018, which I obviously forgot about until your research is it frustrates me because it is more in alignment with me than what I actually ended up doing. And this goes to point out, like we have the answers, but sometimes Mm. we have the belief in our answers. Mm. And so in June of 2018, Carpe Diem writing blogs about 
seizing the most out of life would would be something that I would stumble across and build with the podcast. But in that moment, I had the idea and I didn't trust myself because I asked, I told myself that's not going to make money. Mm. And I tried that with, with the sunny times. I tried that with command your time back in, in 2009. I, I can't make money doing carpe diem. I'm going to try something that, that people are seeing as making money. So I, I started doing drop shipping, which to me now looking back, like, Carpe diem was the answer. Carpe diem was the source. That was the actual <laughs> truth of what I should be doing. Um, and so I didn't do that. I didn't do the thing that was in my heart. I did the thing that other people thought was a good idea online. The people who were follow, I was following and who were making money. And at the time that was drop shipping. And drop shipping is when you take products from one place and you don't hold the products yourself and you just ship them to the people who um, who receive the products, the customer. So you're and a middle so I, person. So you're the middleman. Thank you. And I I was trying different products. And you know, during this time when I'm I'm procrastinating the work of doing this, I'm listening to podcasts, loving podcasts, enjoying it, not knowing the foreshadowing of what that meant or why. I just knew like I didn't want to do a work sometimes like doing the ads and the copy, but like, let me listen to this podcast. That'll help me in some sense. So I, I start, I come across a product that like actually starts working and the product was the keychains, these custom keychains that were specific to anniversary dates or birthdays. So people can gift them to other people and they can gift them as, as, gifts for, for their, their anniversaries or for their birthdays. And I, I started making money from doing this. Like all my, all what I intended to happen starting in June of 2018, right after I graduated, started happening in September, October, it really started to work. And when it started to work, I then doubled down on the idea. I ended up getting hired by a company to teach other people what I was doing and how I was doing it. And life was great in some sense on the material level in that I could then move out to San Diego with my friends and like we were all together and I was bringing aboard one of my friends to help me out with some of the jobs that I was working on. And it was just like, I got everything I wanted in some sense. And then I realized after about six months, I got everything I wanted and this isn't right. Like it doesn't feel right in my soul. The reason why it doesn't feel right in your soul is because what's in your soul is carpe diem. <laughs> there's, there's a, there's a, there's something that needs to be expressed throughout you. And if it is not, you are going to feel the consequences of it. And mm -hmm. you are going to create dis-ease in yourself through alcohol or drinking and gambling or drugs or whatever it may be. And so I realized that. And, and so I, I was really upset with myself for going down this road. I was really upset at what I was doing. I was confused. Hmm. Um, and then in September of 2019, I start meditating. I, I quit the job that I was doing. I quit the dropshipping. I was like, I'm not going down that route. And because I'm not doing that anymore, I'm going to start meditating every day in the morning, 20 minutes. And I'm going to do this program, 75 hard. And 75 hard, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> all right so okay first of all i want to express some compassion for young danny in that moment of you know you were very heated and passionate about like carpe diem was it you know and i ignored it yeah, yeah. uh this is huge because uh i i can't i can i would be surprised if anyone cannot relate to such a an experience of knowing inside what is right for them on some level and uh and doing something else usually out of fear um maybe out of other things peer pressure or whatever or other pressure but that's you know and you were young man you were young you're still you still are young <laughs> but um but um i guess i just you know also the the money thing and the need to support yourself like that's real mm -hmm. and the way i see that is like 
I don't know if you've if you've heard of uh, internal family systems uh, therapy model, but the the basis of it is that you have uh, you have different parts inside of you, uh, and they they can represent. You can think of this in a lot of different ways. They have, that's one specific model, but like you can think of it as your every age you ever were, right? Like that's one way of looking at it. But also you can just look at it as there are different needs. Whether you want to use like Maslow's hierarchy as a way of thinking of it, but like there's part of you that has a need for security. Part of everybody that needs has a need for security. So. That's real. And you attended to that. Young Danny attended to that need, recognized it and attended to it. And was it at the expense of your passion? Yeah, maybe. But, you know, it was you were still you were tending to that piece. And then after a while, you realized you were neglecting this other piece, this soul piece. Right. And and so you 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 made another decision. But this tension of you know, because it occurred to me, it's very easy as a someone outside <laughs> to to you know viewing it is you know you dropped carpe diem to 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 do drop shipping oh wow and do you think i mean it's it's beside the point now but just for the sake of other people listening do you think it would have been possible for you then given you know your resourcefulness at that time and uh and everything else, the other factors of your life. Do you think you could have done both? Do you think you could have attended to your material needs, like with the job, but done the blog on the side? It's and it, it's a question. There's no right answer. I'm just curious. I know personally, I couldn't have done it mm -hmm. because when I go into something new, it's like I'm so consumed by that thing yeah. that it feels like it's the only thing in the world. So I I know a lot other people, many other people can. But I've historically been, it's been very difficult for me to focus on two things at once, especially thy, when it's Know new. thyself. Yeah, know thyself. That's a valid answer. And and I, I you know, I salute it and I, I relate to it. <laughs> um, so, okay. Yeah. You, you brought up meditation in 75 hard. So where did the idea come from for each and what was the order of them? literally the same day it started really which yeah. was hold on i've got <laughs> i've got it here september 18th 2019 yeah and so what, what not, happened on what where, you know what happened cosmically on that date <laughs> well i i it might be the same day it also might be the same week it just okay. like how okay. how memory serves sure but the point is they were so similarly and closely aligned that it, it might as well have been the same day um so I don't know exactly what 75 hard, where that came from. And I think it came from just stumbling across it online and feeling called to it, feeling like this was the thing. I just quit my job and I needed something to ground myself to reality to help me move forward. And that was the thing. That was the thing that seemed to have made the most sense when I didn't have a plan and I just quit this job, the thing that was paying me money. What am I going to do in the meantime? I'm going to figure it out and I'm going to figure it out with this program. So that was the first thing. It had everything I needed. It, two workouts a day, which I was already doing in San Diego, uh, reading 10 pages of a book, uh, following a diet of some sort, taking a progress picture and drinking a gallon of water. I was basically doing these every day, but I wasn't, I wasn't consistent about hitting them. And doing the program forced me to be consistent about hitting them. And I had a friend who I live with who I said, yo, I'm doing this. If you want to do it, you can do it as well. He did it for, I think, like 20 days or something like that. But then I also had a friend, Tej Dosa, episode one of the podcast, maybe the most recurring guest of the podcast, who I texted to that first day I did it, I texted to him that I was doing it. And then he said he was in immediately. And we did it together, the whole program. And he's the reason why I started meditating not because he told me to start meditating, but because I could feel in him an optimism, a love for life, an appreciation of everything that he was doing. And just he tweeted differently. Similar to how I noticed in Gary Vaynerchuk, this guy is doing something differently. He's operating with more self-awareness and kindness and love. Like Tej is doing that too in his own way. And I noticed that. And one thing that he had been doing for 10 years at that time was meditate. And I knew that and I appreciated that. And I was like, I don't know if meditation will work for me. It probably won't, but like, let me just do that because Tej does it. And he did 75 hard with me. So I figured it would make sense. So that's the story of, of starting meditation and 75 hard. And it's worth noting that you met Tej over Twitter. 
Yes, very well said. And I haven't met this man to this day. And, <laughs> and I was texting him yesterday about how we need to meet in person. And he's booking flight for December to come to Austin, Texas, where we will share an embrace and a hug wow. that will be really just a long time coming and an incredible soul that he is and that we've we've been able he's helped me so much in life hmm. and so i can't wait to to finally meet him yeah again i love these ripples you know um it's easy to feel i think in this day and age maybe more than ever because we all we all have this incredible ability to communicate and to have our thoughts instantly shared it's it's unprecedented um and yet people feel so disconnected so alone so isolated it's an interesting paradox um but for those who feel and i had a conversation on my with my previous guest about this idea of mattering and how how do you how can you feel like anything you do matters in a world that a full of noise where it's just easy to feel ignored drowned out you know how could anything that i do have make any difference right and um the thing is is that everything you do makes a difference in some way it affects your immediate space which affects the immediate space around that and you have an impact on one person i mean think of how much tej has impacted the world just through impacting you even if you hadn't stayed friends right i mean like the, and you can speculate on this stuff endlessly which i like to do <laughs> me too and i i think about that all the time and i think about the people who have instilled even more belief in my vision and mission and they, like i appreciate everyone so much mm. like and it's all interconnected and it's all it all like feeds into each other and the decisions that you make actually like I see it. I see it change people. And I'm like, I didn't even know that was changing you. And then you told me after the fact that it did. And I think I feel like, I mean, I'm at this point right now where I know everything matters. Mm. And, you know, when you say like, how could you even know nothing, mat like anything matters at all? I'm like, I live every day with like, you smile at someone for an extra second and, and it matters. And like, you could see how their vibration changes. And so I know so what true. you're talking about. But I also like don't resonate with it and I haven't resonated with it in a long time because of the the work that I've been putting in on myself and I see how that changes the people around me and I see their energy being different. I just like, wow, I don't know. I don't know like why I've been given this ability to notice that with my own body and mind, but like, I mean, we all have it. We all have a mattering. We all have a purpose, a calling. Uh, and even if you don't just like pretending like you do can impact the world so much. So yeah. when you, when you have an, a, an experience or an awareness that, that what you do does have an effect positive or negative. And when you can really take in the fact that everything you do or don't do for that matter matters. I mean, the weight of that responsibility might be overwhelming if you really, really take it in, right? But if you take it in just enough to know, to get over any fear of, of not mattering, then you realize the power and the responsibility of it. And then, and then hopefully you act with greater intention because you know you realize that the the energy you walk into a room with does make a difference the smile you give someone or don't does make a difference and if you if you realize that it's not like you know you don't want it to paralyze you and, and overwhelm you right but but it it can at least help you behave in a way that is in line with well if i may quote my own show title the person you want to be right um so i love this i love the the transformation that I, and and it's all documented, which is so fantastic online. Uh, you know, when I, I am I am completely blown away from ages you know twenty five to twenty eight, like the transformation in you and what you have generated and and put out into the world. It is amazing, Danny. Like seriously, it's it's amazing, and um, I have the utmost respect having a, a point of reference as to what goes into doing deep research and 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 all the pieces of doing one interview and that you're going to be like you're going to be episode 35 for me so the the thought of 400 plus 
I, I literally, I, I don't even know. I, I don't even understand it, but it is, uh, you're a force of nature. <laughs> Thank you. And I think sometimes looking so far into the distance mm. makes it so intimidating and, and stops us from acting. I mean, that was the case for me was I was looking at who I could become. And I was like, that seems so out there and so much work that I'm not even going to start. Right. Because right. the weight of that is so overwhelming. So I said to myself, how can I just be that person today? Okay. Joe Rogan does three episodes a week. How can I just be that person this week? Right. And if I do three episodes a week, I am in essence the same. I'm putting in the same work as him. Hence, I will be in enough time of reflection of myself that. And so it's the weight that I felt. I felt such pressure that I'm 24 years old. I know the potential for what I have done in my past and I don't have the consistency or the discipline to stick through it. What is wrong with me? Am I going to die without ever seeing my potential? Am I going to die while being just potential? Like to me, that was, it was all consuming and it was mm -hmm. depressing. And that was part of being down in those moments was realizing I had something and not using it. That wow. sometimes could be as, as painful as, as anything else. So what would you say was the most difficult thing you've been through the most difficult period of your life? However you want to um, frame it, the greatest difficulty you've overcome and how did you get through it? How did you overcome it? So I was telling you about the, the meditation that I was doing and, and 75 hard and I'm building myself up from September 19, 2019 to December of 2019 into this new character, into this new being. January 2020 rolls around and my friend visits from high school. He comes to San Diego and we go out and we party like I'm in high school or college again. And I'm sitting there after he comes and I'm like, oh my God. Was this all for nothing? Was this all was this all fake? This this character that I built of myself? If I can just go back to my old ways like that, am I am I even real and what have I built anything? That thought played in my mind for one month straight and I was depressed out of my mind for maybe even two months till COVID happened. And it got even worse because I'm and COVID happens. It's March of 2020, and I'm like oh, wow, not only am I a failure because I reneged on the person that I was, but now also the world is ending. And then like, <laughs> right. <laughs> yeah. So, so two weeks into COVID happening in the lockdowns, I was like, all right, I'm going to either make this the worst time of my life, or I'm going to come out of this the best time of my life. And I, I made that conscious decision. And I, I bought the domain dannymiranda.com. And to me, that was like a, a big, a small win that was really big because I was like, I've never been, had access to this domain. This is my name. This is now I, I can put things out there that are in alignment with my name and that what, what do I want to put out that's in alignment with my name? So I wrote, started writing two blog posts a week. And that was so impactful of like, this is my name on it. So I need to make sure that this is in alignment with the person that I want to be. So yeah, that was the darkest moment when I had done it. And then I came back down yeah. because I was like, and I, I ended up in even a worse place than I was in August of 2019 in February of 2020 because of how, how much I'd built myself, but that it felt like for nothing. Wow. There's another piece that I'm aware of just through my research, which is that in February of 2020, you had a conversation with your parents that was, it sounded from the way the little you said about it was really liberating for you. Do, can you uh, share what that was about? Do you know what I'm referring to? Yes, it, it was very liberating for me. And I, I haven't spoke too much about it. It was telling them a truth. It was telling them, it was telling them like the ways in which I was harming myself. And like, listen, guys, like I said to my parents, like, you know, I drink alcohol way too much. I party way too much. 
I'm a failure as a human being. Mm. I wasted all my college years. It's really how I felt deep in my being. Things that I don't resonate with today at all. But that was the truth of it. And I, I just told them like how much I feel like I'd wasted my potential in my life. And I was okay with like, with just being not enough. And just like, and their response to me was like, you, thank you for being honest. And like, we love you and we appreciate you and we support you and we'll, we'll help you get on the right path. And so that to me was why it was liberating because I owned the truth of what mm -hmm. I was feeling and what I had done to harm myself and them in those college years and, and after. Hmm. Yeah. And I imagine that as your parents, they showed you that you might have seen yourself that way, but that they didn't see you that way. So they appreciated your sharing what was your what was true for you, what was your truth with them. And maybe they were able to help you poke even a tiny hole in your vision of yourself and see that there was that there was hope and that this wasn't um this wasn't like truth with a capital T or didn't have to stay that way. Yeah, that, that resonates. I mean, they were willing to look at what I was saying, but investigate it with me in a way that was non-judgmental and was very helpful. Yeah. And importantly, they weren't dismissing it. They weren't saying, oh, stop it, Danny. Like, you know, like they were, they were, you know, they, and that's really important. I think, you know, I mean, someone's truth is their truth and none of us have a, um, uh, none of us have like ultimate T truth <laughs> <laughs> access at all times i don't think um you know and it's and it's it's that's why i know you love derek sivers i love derek sivers we've, we've had him on, on our respective podcasts and he's great at questioning constantly questioning himself his own thoughts and his own perspectives and trying on new new ones and um when you're i think the lowest the lowest point a person can um arrive at is lack is when you utterly lack perspective when you believe that the worst worst interpretation of yourself is all there is and is the truth and you're unable to see outside of of that 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 to me is 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 hell on earth that is despair and um you know it's only by the grace of whatever happens to give us perspective in such moments to um uh become aware of other possibilities or to even just uh, put a little bit of doubt into the, the, the real truth of it. Um, I know we're, we're lingering on that, but I think it's a really important point. I agree. No, I, I really agree. And, and what they did. And the thing is like at a deep level, like I knew my parents would have that reaction or that response because mm -hmm. I knew them as parents. I knew them as people for, for 24 years. And, but facing the responsibility. That was what I didn't want to do. I didn't want to face the responsibility of, okay, like these are your problems. So now you have to actually do something about them. Mm -hmm. And that moment was like the breaking point for me of facing responsibility or facing my issues so that I can move forward. And, and I mean, like I said, like none of this happens without my parents, without my grandparents, mm -hmm. because they are the foundation with which it is all built on. Yeah. And hopefully if you're not as fortunate to have such a support system by with, you know, from blood relatives, um, it can come from anywhere, including apparently as you've uh, made a good case for social media. I mean, you can connect with other souls who see you in ways that you might not be able to yet even see yourself. So I think wherever you can find people who are, see you, see your positive potential and to see you beyond your own vision of of your or your own ability to see yourself and can challenge that um is is a important thing and very very helpful and important thing you begin meditating you do you know and you said you start you bought i love this you bought dannymiranda.com and i love the 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 metaphor of that like you're now taking uh ownership you're authoring your life in a very intentional way i had my own 
domain name. I sat on it for 15 years before I built a website with it. Wow. That? Why? <laughs> Why? Um, it was a coworker of mine back in 2006 that had um, encouraged me to do it. To She's like, you should get that domain name, you know, just do it. Like just have it. He was big into collecting domain names, which I wasn't, but he just said, get that. And I, I thought, okay, that whatever, maybe someday I'll do something with it. Why did it take 15 years? It's a good question for uh, maybe uh, uh, another conversation. <laughs> um, so um, at what point did you do, I know you did 60 days of meditation, 60 minutes each day. And it was inspired by Naval Ravikant. When did, when did you do this in the chronology and how did, how did the idea, you know, uh, infiltrate you? So starting in March of 2020, I started, when I started being, I started noticing, like I was either going to, I made the decision. I was like, I'm going to, I'm going to get better from COVID or I'm going to get worse. And I, I see that's clearer. I said, I'm going to meditate 20 minutes in the morning and 20 minutes in the evening. So I did that for two months. And then I was doing 40 minutes a day and I heard about Naval's challenge. So I was like, let me do 60 minutes, 60 minutes straight. And I got so deep on myself starting in May of 2020 that I ended up doing it till December of 2020. It was a, a 60 day challenge, but I, I just loved it so much that I continued. And it's no surprise that in July of 2020, I have the idea for the podcast. In August of 2020, I start recording episodes. And in September of 2020, I release the first episode. And so that to me speaks to the importance of literally going inward, of, of analyzing your own thoughts, of just sitting there and being, because it's hard for me to imagine me doing 60 minutes of meditation wasn't going to help me create the actions that were more in alignment with my truth, my purpose, my reason for being here. And and it did. And so to me, that was the biggest thing that has helped me uh, become a more in aligned person and help me become the person that I want to be doing those, those 60 minute sessions. And I'm, I'm so grateful for, for that time. And have you been able to maintain the meditation practice, not necessarily 60 minutes, but um, consistently since then? Yeah, I do 20 minutes to go to bed and I sleep like a baby huh. right every night. So like that is that is consistent in the process. Do you ever fall asleep before the 20 minutes are up? I don't use a timer. So sometimes it could be mm. 25, sometimes it could be 30, sometimes it could be 10, sometimes it could be 15. So you, but, while you're lying in bed before you go to sleep is when you meditate? Up, upright, like oh, okay. I'll be upright with the cover over me, uh, legs out, and then I'll inevitably get tired from that, from watching the thoughts go, and then I'll go to bed. Interesting. Yeah, cool. I haven't done it at, right before bed like that. Um you have said that you haven't always been a curious person, which is like really hard to believe for anyone that's listened to your podcast. So I'm, I want, I want to know, I mean, all right. <laughs> that's, when do you feel your curiosity kicked in and what was the impetus for that? Was that connected to meditation or something else? Meditation. Yeah. Absolutely. I mean, I would do, when I started doing these 60 minute sessions, I would look around at like, the grass and look in the grass and be like, what's in there? Is that a bug? What, where's this bug come from? What's going on? I look at a tree and just like have all these questions about it. And that never happened, Eric, not wow. once before really? meditation. Not even as a kid. That you I mean, can... I, not that I can recall. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. So. But you were, I mean, I'll challenge that a little bit because you were certainly curious about like, what's this thing called the internet? What can yes. I do on fair. it? Like what, you know, right? Like, yeah, that, that's um, fair. But but not curious about the nature surrounding me. Yeah. I never can recall. And that was the biggest, like looking at an animal and feeling connected to it in some way or looking at just like a bird and asking like, why is it making that noise? Like to me, that part of the world, like I don't, I don't feel any like connection or calling to any animals in any way. And I think I'm pretty unusual in that. But meditation gave me the glimpse or understanding of like, being open to that and open to people and how their brains were working to a deeper level that I had never considered before. You've 
used the word calling or called or calls. Yes. And um, I'd love to hear you just speak on that subject and what you think that's about, how a person becomes aware of a calling, mm -hmm. um, how you tune into them. What's the experience like for you of having something called to you? The best way that I've experienced it has been through meditation. I've also, I've gone to church a little bit since being in Austin. I feel uh, that there's something there as well with so many people who are like worshiping God or or looking at God at the same time at the same place. There seems to be something there. But to me, when I say calling, it feels like, like if you just go through the story of my life, like, like we have. I don't, I don't, I can't help but notice a through line that wasn't there by any decision that I made. I love that. And, and if you really sit with that, it forces you to ask yourself, like, what's going on there? And to me, following the calling is following that through line to the best of my abilities mm -hmm. of knowing that, yeah, I get control over driving this car, this body, this mind. But also like I don't in some sense, because if I don't follow that, I will have some dis-ease and I, I can have the dis-ease if I want. Like that's that's perfectly allowed in this simulation, but it it is helpful to yourself and the people around you if you follow this calling, if you follow this direction that life is flowing, that you that is there not by your choosing, but just in you. So- that that to me is a really deep idea. And that's kind of what I mean by calling. It's like you could see the sunny times. You could see me writing. You could so like why would I stop doing that? Why like you only stop doing that? So yeah, what are your thoughts? What what comes to Do mind? you feel that there is just a singular calling that shows up maybe at in different ways throughout your life, pointing you in the same direction? Or do you think that there are different types of callings or multiple callings or even callings that change throughout the course of your life. I think, I think the calling that like, I think love plays a big role in this and in terms of calling for all people and how love gets expressed is different for different people. So I think what I'm experiencing when I'm writing or when I'm covering the Knicks, when I'm 15, is like, I feel love because I get to watch these players and I get to write about them and I get to be with them in some sense. So I'm, I'm experiencing love for that moment. And I think that, you know, when I do the podcast, it's like, I'm loving the other person. I am making sure the other person feels loved. And I'm hoping that the audience feels that as well. And the through line through it all is like love. And it's like, Hmm. I think that is the calling of my life and perhaps everyone's lives. And I think how that gets expressed is different for LeBron James versus me and how that gets expressed is different for me versus you, maybe in some slight way. But I think the calling is love. Beautifully said. I don't think I've ever heard anyone put it that way before. And there were other threads I could pull on in what you shared because you said in this simulation, which I couldn't help but notice and just kind of chuckle at because who who knows what, what this all is. <laughs> but I love this idea of it's there inside you, not by a choice you made. Like you didn't decide on it to put mm -hmm. it there, but but you can decide whether or not you ignore it, suppress it, trust it, follow it, um, embrace it at any given point, right? Um, so you begin danielmiranda.com. You start doing two blog posts a week. And then you, you at some point, as you mentioned, after meditating, came up with the idea to do the podcast. Did the podcast replace the blog or was it in addition to the blog? At first it was in addition. And then it was it was replaced because I was getting so much joy from connecting with people and interviewing them. And I wasn't getting as much joy from writing. And yeah. I just, I let that go. Like I let the writing go for the time being, because I was like, I have to follow where the energy is calling me to. And for those who are unfamiliar with your superhero origin story, 
the podcast didn't just happen because you decided you wanted to start a podcast. There was a maybe purer, uh, you could say, you could argue, um, calling that 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 you had. So tell us about that, which led to the podcast. So in July of 2020, you have to understand, I went from being depressed out of my mind in the lowest of lows in February 2020 to July being so loving life, so appreciative for the gifts that I've been given because I'd been putting in the work on myself and doing the things I knew I was capable of doing to become the person that I wanted to be, that I was feeling excited. I was feeling like I was, you know, my brother was starting to do 75 hard himself in June of 2020. I noticed the impact that made on him. And I was like, this, I, I actually have something here. Like I, I have a love for life. I have an excitement. So I put out on Twitter, who wants to talk on the phone? And because I have this joy and this energy and this feeling of we can do this and life is great and COVID's happening and a lot of people aren't experiencing that, the phone calls that I was having on Twitter with these people from around the world were incredible. There was so much energy exchanged. There was so much joy that I said to myself, I got to record these conversations. <laughs> like people are getting some healing or some help or something. I'm getting it myself because I'm connecting with so many other amazing people. So I started recording the conversations and a recorded conversation, Eric. That's that's just a podcast. <laughs> and so, so I I started recording these conversations with my friends. Zoom mics off or uh screens off, mics on. So it was just audio only to maintain the the feeling of what the conversations were when they were phone calls. And it was great. I did that for, for 38 episodes. And that was the origin of the podcast was the phone calls that I was doing in July of 2020 and August of 2020. How many phone calls do you think you did before you decided to start recording them? I would say probably 20 to 30. Okay. Did, did any of those people become actual guests on your podcast? Yeah, absolutely. I don't remember which ones specifically, but um, yeah, no, definitely. I had some guests that were, that turned into friends that I invited them on. Absolutely. Nice. Again, social media, get making your friends on Twitter. Who knew? Uh, who knew? Um, and what sorts of conversations were you having in these pre-podcast one-on-one -on -one phone calls with people from all over the world? I would say that the phone calls were probably centered around purpose and centered around meaning of life and how much meaning the people were getting out of life. And so a lot of times these tweets kind of, they they went beyond the circle of people who were following me. So I put out who wants to talk on the phone. And a lot of people, some of the people reached out were like depressed or feeling down and they just wanted someone else to talk to. Mm -hmm. So a lot of that was around like, how do you get back to a place of normalcy? How do you get back to a place of finding meaning and purpose in your own life? And I knew it because I had done it. And I, I felt like an expert because in February of 2020, I was in a bad place and now I'm in a great place. And that was the second time that I had done that. Because in August of, of 2019, I was feeling down and then I had revitalized myself. So like the more times that I had overcome, the more confident I was in giving people a clear direction to go to. And it wasn't, my intention wasn't to help people in that way, but that is somehow what the conversations turned to when the people weren't aligned that I was speaking to. When the people were aligned, it was just a joy and a mutual appreciation and a love for life. And, but when they weren't, I would help guide them to that place or ask them questions that might help them guide them to that place of more meaning and purpose in their own life. How long do you think these calls went Oh, I know the longest one was like three or four hours. Yeah. I know that for sure. But in on average, I would say probably an hour. Right. What a cool idea. And I just love 25-ish year old Danny for acting on it. <laughs> it's incredible if you think about it, right? Like, and and we all have that power in every moment. And maybe no one responds and maybe no one sees it, but if you've got 500 friends on on Facebook or Instagram, you put out an Instagram story right now that says, who wants to talk on the phone? 
how many lives can you make better? How many people need that phone call who will reach out, right? And it's a power available to us in every moment. Just like reaching out, saying, putting out a broad message. Who wants to talk on the phone? And you can connect with other human beings and you can use social media to do that, like in a real way. So, yeah, it's beautiful. And more broadly, so I loved it was this impulse to connect. And as you said, there are many ways of potentially doing that. Um, but in an even broader way, it was an idea that you, that occurred to you, but you acted on it. I and mean, we all have ideas, hundreds, thousands, millions of them. And some of them we act on and some of them we don't. And some of them we shouldn't. Some of them it's good that we don't. <laughs> Let's be clear about that. Um, but you know, the way that you describe your relationship with meditation, I have that relationship and have had for many years with journaling. And one of the things, one of the many benefits of it for me, one of the things I love about it is it's a it's a place and a space to simply just get your ideas out of your head and then ground them onto the page. And then you can decide whether the whether they're worth entertaining further or whether you want to do something with them or about them or act on them or not. And sometimes they'll be the ideas will be nagging. So you might have the idea and say, okay, that's nice. And it keeps coming back, like keeps coming up. And eventually you're like, all right. <laughs> um, so anyway. And that's that's calling, right? Yeah. The idea that keeps coming back over and over and over. And you can't get rid of it even if you tried. I can't get rid of Carpe Diem even if I tried. I can't get <laughs> rid of the sunny times even if I tried. If I tried, you go into disease. But that's what the call, that's really like the the better way to frame the calling is the thing that keeps popping up over and over and over again that you can't get rid of. Hmm. So here's something else that really struck me as unique uh, in your in your journey. You make this decision to start a podcast and it's an experiment, right? Like you're going to see if you like it. So you're going to try it out. Now, anyone else that I know would say, all right, maybe I'll give it like, you know, five episodes, you know, maybe like if they're generous, like, ah, I'll do 10 episodes. That's a lot. And if I do 10, then I'll get a sense of, do I like this or not? But you... In fact, I even heard Tim Ferriss do a years ago do do a show about podcasting. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. And he said, "Do six. He said, "Record six before you and then make a decision." You said, "Yeah, I'm just going to do a hundred. Like then, then I'll get an idea of whether or not I like it." <laughs> Talk to me about that. <laughs> so I had something at the time, and I still agree with this idea called the three month rule. The three-month rule says that you can't judge a habit or a behavior until you've done it for three months. And you can't decide if it's for you, if everyone agrees with it and everyone thinks it's a good idea, but you decide you don't want to do it, that's fine. But you have to give yourself three months of actually trying it. And so for me, I thought, okay, well, 100 episodes, if I were to do three months, that's like one episode a day around. So if you if you extend that, if you do it a hundred times, you could you could decide if that type of workout for your mind is something you should be doing or is in alignment with you. And I felt like, all right, I'll do one a week so I can get there in two years. Like that, that makes sense. Hmm. The problem was, or the solution or something that was incredible about this thing was that in the first 30 days of recording episodes, I had done 20. And I hadn't been meaning to do 20. I It was just like, I was. I want to talk to this person. I want to talk to that person. I want, and all of a sudden, I had 20 episodes in the backlog before even releasing a single episode. And so I said, okay, if I do one a week, then the 20th one that I do, that person's going to see it 20 weeks from now. They're going to be a different person. That's not really right to them to post that episode 20 weeks from now. I think I have six weeks of backlog right here. Like, let's go. Let's do it. And so that kind of started the big pace or the pace that I was on is like, I had done 20 episodes in 30 days. I'm living at home with my parents, not doing much except this podcast and devoting my life to it. And so that's kind of what started the journey. And that's, that's what made me build that pace as well. 
in some way. So the hundred came from understanding. You do something a hundred times, you're going to get, you're going to have more understanding of if that thing is meant for you or not. Where did the three month rule come from that idea for you? It came from meditation and it Mm. came from 75 hard and knowing that after 75 days, I was a completely different person and of doing the workouts and the reading. And then also it came from with the meditation. I started the meditation September of 2019. And then in December of 2019, I come home from San Diego for the first time, which meant I drove a car for the first time. And when I drove the- wait, wait, wait. You drove I drove a- the car for the first time in, in a year since oh, I've been You home didn't have a car had- while, while you were in San Diego. Okay. Thank you. Yes. I didn't have a car while I was in San Diego. I missed that important detail. And so I stop at a red light and I look at, and I feel my body tense up. This is after three months of meditation. I'm sitting behind the wheel. I look at the red light and I'm like, why isn't this light red? Why isn't this light green? Why isn't this light green? Like, what like change change and i'm like i noticed that thought and i'm like oh my god meditation works that was the first time that i realized meditation worked that was the first sense that i got that all this 20 minutes every morning could actually change my response because my reaction was one thing and then i laughed at my reaction and then my mood completely changed because i was like that's hilarious i've been doing that every time i stopped at a red light and i was (laughs) like this thing actually works. And how long did it take it for it to work? It took three months. So if this is true for meditation, oh, wow. I remember when I was lifting weights for the first time, it took three months for me, for people to realize that I've been lifting weights. Wow. This is crazy. So like, and then like, it was funny because Gary Vaynerchuk came on the podcast for episode 39. How long did that take? Three months. I'm like, oh my God, are people Uh noticing this? There's something here. And, And it's been true for the big, the moments that have made sense for me happen after three months of putting in work on that thing. And if it's not supposed to be, then, and you're not making progress in three months, you're mm. maybe doing it wrong, or that's not the thing for you to do. Wow. That is quite a way of framing it. It's so interesting because I'm a believer personally in whatever works because it's just so obvious to me that different things work for different people and even yourself at different times of your life. So I love hearing what works for other people and, you know, maybe stealing ideas and, and um, trying things out, but ultimately like the buck stops with your gut, right? Like as to uh, what, what is right for you. Um, And only you can determine that. But I, I think that that's a great, you presented a really good argument for the the three month rule. And you, maybe it was because of your, it sounds like it was because of your experience with 75 hard that you were willing to put in three months, even when you weren't noticing any benefit until you were at that red light. And you reminded me of a good friend of mine who in college, when he would be, I would be in the car with him. His line was whenever he was at a, a, a light and it turned green and the person in front of him wasn't immediately moving. He would say, he would say, green means go. (laughs) I mean, the car is an incredible place to determine one's own spiritual alignment. Yeah. That's a good good way of putting it. And I just noticed how the more I meditated, the more comfortable I was within every situation. Someone cuts me off. It's all good. You know, and that happened only because of meditation. The, The light is red instead of green. It's all good. And I realized, oh, this is related to my own being and what I'm thinking about the things externally are just related to how much work I've done in my own mind and how aligned I am in my own being. Yeah, beautiful. You made, I've heard you make the best case for meditation that I have ever heard anyone make in your in uh, the end of your conversation with, I have his name further down in my notes. We'll get to him. Uh, it was a very recent one you did. Uh, his name is uh, Chris Bussing. Yes. At the, at the very end of your conversation yes. with him, you made, uh, I was like, that's this hands down the best case I've ever heard, succinct and impactful for like meditating. And I've been very inconsistent in my life with meditating, but I am, I've been back on board the last couple of weeks because just weirdly, not at all by my design, like 
the last however many of my guests meditation has been like has come up as a profound as like this is just ridiculous already so and i know from my own experience you know i mean i think a lot of us can relate like when you're exercising and you're in that you're in that groove and you're feeling great and you're consistent with it and then you let it go and you know it's good for you but you know, for whatever reason, you might have difficulty getting yourself to do it. That's that. That's been my relationship with meditation. Other things I in, I've internalized, and they're just habits, and you know, they they're deeply uh, ingrained. And even if I miss it f- for a period of time, like I go right back to it. It's it's solid. With meditation, it hasn't been like that for me, but I've I've um, I'm I'm trying again. I'm beginning again, which is what meditation is. It's when your mind drifts and you become aware of it. No problem. You just begin again back to the breath. It, it's surprising to me that you haven't spent considerable time meditating because you have a meditative presence about you. Mm. It's like one of the first things I noticed. So that's uh, maybe why you don't need it is because you already have so much of it in your being. <laughs> maybe. <laughs> or maybe it's other things, you know, maybe it's journaling and 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 any number of other things. Um. I love the origin story of your podcast. I love how it came from this pure desire to connect with others and that you had these conversations that lifted both both people. And then it dawned on you that you should start recording them. And I, and I heard you say the reason for that was that other people could benefit from hearing these conversations. So then you started, rec- but when you started recording them, you did it just as Skype calls and screens off. So it was just, the purity of the experience that you had on the phone, the you know the original calls that you did, and then obviously it's 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 evolved since then, <laughs> in the three years since then, um, and I'm so glad to again just just like shout out to 25 year old Danny for making that decision. And when you think, I think anybody when you think about the decisions in your life that have reaped you the greatest rewards, just let's take a moment, everyone, to just salute that younger version of ourselves that did that thing. Thank goodness, right? <laughs> like how much gratitude for that younger version of ourself that did whatever it was that that reaped rewards, the likes of which we could never have even imagined. Um, and all the work we had to do on ourselves before that to be available enough and to to act on that impulse, whatever that was. And I, I can think of many examples from my own life. I'm sure any listener can think of at least one from theirs. So gratitude is is another thing that I'm moving in the direction toward because it just seems like the answer to almost everything. I've seen it said that um, you can't be gra- grateful and anxious at the same time. I don't know if that's true, but I love that. <laughs> It seems like it's a been good true answer. in my own life. Hmm. Um, all right. So here's a here, let's let's this is a good reality question for you. We talked earlier about the tension between the safety needs, the security needs, the the money needs, the basic sort of like roof over your head, food on your table needs, and then the soul, the deeper soul level needs of expressing yourself and and feeling like you're using yourself in the most positive way you possibly can and that the and how that feeds your soul when you do that when you're doing the thing that like it just is like you know this is why i'm here even if it's not ordained uh by some outside party it just it fills you it lights you up it makes you feel internally uh, to use your word aligned or like you're you're you know you're this being with these various characteristics and and talents and strengths and and personality, you know, and and when you do certain things, you're like, this is the best way I could be using myself right now. Like this just, you feel it. It just feels fantastic. And speaking for myself, my goal for a long, long, long time has been how do I get the soul needs and the um, basic financial needs met simultaneously? Hmm. And is that even the best way to go about it? Because again, it's whatever works and different things work for different people and different things work for the same person at different stages of life. So on this topic, um, my question for you, first question would be, how have you supported yourself 
through this podcast journey over the last three years and how do you personally balance the need, what we let's call them the money need and the soul need? How do you balance those two? It's an incredible question. And it's, and it's something I struggled with for a long time. Um, in, when I started the podcast, I lived at, at home and God bless my parents. They just allowed me to just live in their their home and their place and i could record podcasts nonstop and feed my passion and feed with energy um uh, and I, I worked part time as like helping out my friend who runs a photo booth company and so i zach. i would help him out yeah zach zach program and and that was wonderful like as a just a way to get out of the house meet people connect with people and and pay you know to my parents and pay like just have some money to have on the side um it got to be to a point where i was like i i want to be out on my own so because of that i then took a job working for an nft company doing podcasting for them and I was like, well, I love NFTs. I love, you know, where the world is going. This might be where the world is going. I love podcasting. So it's going to be, this makes sense. And I can get paid doing this, getting paid for a passion. Oh my God, this sounds incredible. And that wasn't it. And I, I realized that that was not part of my calling as well, but that was how I was, was thinking at the time in what, August or September of 2021. And, and that was great for like the passion or excitement I had in that time. Um, and then in after that, I started doing consulting for different oh, people. Can we who, back up just a, yeah, for a yeah, second? So that it. that's okay. Yeah, that was Lucky Trader? Yes. yes Did they Lucky come Trader. to you? Did they yes. find you because of your podcast? Yes. So that's yes. worth just like acknowledging. Totally. What, and, and were there things before that? Were there... Um, mm -hmm results from the outside world that that came to you as feedback that what you were putting out into the world was 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 either bringing things to you or or having some yes. kind of effect. So I'd love to hear about those. So David Perel gave me a rite of passage scholarship which is his course on writing in maybe February of 2021. So that was like a sign that things were working. Sean Puri in and how the, far? So like, the, I'm sorry to interrupt. So the no, the, pod, the podcast started in September of 2020. So that only so that was what six months or five months ish yeah. later. Okay. Yeah, exactly. And then Sean Puri offered me a job as a researcher in some capacity in the summer of 2021, and so that was a sign it was working. It didn't end up working out with Sean, but it was a, a sign like things were coming to me as a result of me doing these interviews. And the problem is that when so many things come to you and you don't have the full belief in yourself that what you're doing could lead to long-term monetary outcomes, you're just like, let me take this opportunity because I believe in you more than I believe in myself. And that was the mistake that I made. And that's deep. And that's that is, that is deep. Really? Yeah. That is deep. Yeah. Especially if you're in a, you know, if you're in a desperate place financially, and I don't know if you were, but if you are, it's nearly impossible and maybe even inadvisable to turn down an opportunity that's paid, even if it's not fully aligned. And that's a decision, you know, again, it really is an individual case by case moment, you know, uh, situation by situation, I think decision. But what you said still is very, very powerful um, about the belief in yourself or or the belief in this is this is all that I can attract or that all that I can get this you know and the crazy thing is like looking back it was working you know there was a reason why these people wanted to hire me there was a reason why like the opportunities were coming my way because what I was doing was actually getting the right eyeballs to me but I did not believe in myself that much I did not have that perspective of like, oh, this is going to work out. So that was uh, that was the first thing that I did to make money. Um, and then 
In How long 20... did you last at, at Lucky Trader doing three the, months, uh... three, four months? <laughs> okay. Um, and then in 2022, I sold one of the NFTs that I had, I had as a result. So like I bought my first NFT in, I want to say May of 2021. I think that's right. And then in, in 2022, in the beginning of 2022, I sold the NFT that I, I bought for like a full year's worth of salary. And I was like, oh my God, this is, this is incredible. Like, and that was just luck. You know, that was just like, mm. I wasn't it, trying to, I was just that trying was to independent. Gary I'm sorry. That was independent of the the, the job. Like Correct. that had nothing to do with the job. You said you were, uh, you bought it to support Gary V. So it was his NFT. Yes. Oh, okay. Yeah. And I didn't expect to make money on that. I was just like, all right, if Gary V, I, Gary V supported me when I was 13 years old, I feel like the least I can do is, is, uh, is support him in his launch. And that turned out to be incredible. Yeah. So. And to back up, because we didn't cover it here, although it's covered many, many places elsewhere. When you said Gary V supported you at age 13, can you just give us the quick uh, summary story of that? Yeah. So what I was talking about when I was 13 was him commenting on my blog. What you're talking about probably is when I'm 15, you know, who difference is, is negligible is <laughs> to this day, to this day, this story <laughs> cracks you up. Um, I mean, this has informed so much of what I I do, right? Like on a day-to-day -day basis, calling people. So it, it, it does make sense. Basically what happened was I wanted to go to his book signing. My mom didn't allow me to go to a book signing on a school night because she's a great parent and didn't want me to miss school. I <laughs> said to her, uh, yeah, that, that makes sense. So I tweet to Gary V and I say, Hey Gary, I know you're, I know I wish I could make the book signing tonight in New York city, but I can't, my mom will let me immediately. He sends me a, a DM. That's like, what's your mom's number? And I send him my mom's number. He calls my mom on the spot. My mom doesn't pick up because it's an unknown number and leaves her a voicemail. She ends up letting me come to the book signing. We take a great picture. And it is a, a memory that is so entrenched in me and so deep inside me of like, think about how many times I've told that story and how many people have heard that story. You mentioned like, that's like a common story that people who are familiar with me might know. But the truth is like, I maybe tens of thousands of people have heard that story, maybe more, right? Like, and that's, that's pretty crazy um, to just one kind thing that he did 13 years ago is still paying dividends for mm. him and probably will for the next 10 years, 20 years, 30 years. Like who knows where this ends up going and how many people start thinking positively of Gary Vee because he called a 15 mm. year old's mom one time when he just had that feeling that he should he said he'd done that, what, 10 times in his life. So mm. all that goes to show like, doing kind things for no reason or expectation leads to incredible things in the long run. But uh, yeah, that's, that's kind of why I bought the NFT was because he called my mom when I was 15 years old. So like, and I wrote a blog post about him when I was 13 and he responded and like that made the teenage version of me so happy. Yeah. And then 10 years after the book signing, yes. <laughs> how did you get him on your podcast? I tweeted out a list of my dream guests. And Again, then Twitter, 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 yeah. Twitter. Yeah, I hope. Which I, I have mean, not used. <laughs> I, I mean, and it might be to your benefit if you're not like, if you don't know how to use it, right? Yeah. Most effectively. But I put out on Twitter a list of my dream guests. Then that led me to think about, oh, didn't I write about him when I was 13? And so I remembered that I went to the, the Wayback Machine. It's called oh, on yeah. Google. Uh -huh. And you could find old websites. I found my old website. I found my old blog oh. post that I wrote about him. I tweeted that old blog post that I wrote about him. He followed me. I tweeted that he followed me. After he followed me, a bunch of people suggested that he come on the podcast. Maybe like 50 to 100 people said wow. that. And then he agreed to come on that night on December 4th, 2020, a, a day that I'll never forget because of that. <laughs> and I recorded a podcast with Tej in between. So it's like the perfect day of all days. And it was a, a special, special moment, a special day when I got to tell him that two weeks later about all our history, his face when I told him was like, how you're that guy. What? Like, I can't believe this. Um, 
Yeah, special, special day, special guy, special moment. And for me, I went back and looked at that episode. And the best part of that episode is the very, very end. Yes, I agree. That's my favorite. That sticks with me to this day. I just recorded an episode. I'm so happy you said that. Episode 415 is 15 lessons I've learned. And one of them is that, the last part. And the reason for that is because the last part of it, there's so much I could say here, but the last part- Just do it. Let's hear it. Let it rip. (laughs) I just was, I would, I would, (laughs) that moment was so big for me. And I had so many questions prepared and I wasn't able to flow with the conversation as it was. It was too like- one question, next question, next question. I didn't feel comfortable enough in myself to listen and respond. And it was the first time I'd ever done a 30 minute interview. The rest had been an hour or more. So I was like, I don't know how I'm going to do that while also listening and asking interesting questions. I didn't trust myself. Hmm. So I'd kind of like finished my questions of what I was capable of doing. And he's like, do you have anything else? And I was like, I asked him one final question, but it was an aside. Like he's like, like you were, we were all wrapped up basically. And then he, he, you could see it in his like face. Like he has this just, Sense. yeah. Oh yeah. He just had this like, Hey, like, you know, this is it. Right. So is there anything else, you know, that comes to you that you want to like, he initiated it. Totally. He totally initiated it. And he could sense like how much I admired him and how, how much of a big moment it was for me. Mm-hmm. And it was an example of like, there was no neutrality in what, well, what we were talking about. Like I was just, I admired him too much. If I were to look back, I was starstruck, you know, in a sense. And I asked him about if he knew wine library TV, which was his first YouTube channel, if he knew it was going to be successful. And he said, yes, because the learnings from the process were going to be more valuable than any monetary outcome he could get from it. And to me, that was my thesis with starting the podcast. Mm. That was what has like that thought and that idea and that truth has played true in my own life for the podcast for the past three years. And if I think about it, I'm like, wait, I've been doing the podcast for three years. He he was doing Wine Library TV for three years when when he's when he wrote on my blog. Like, and that is crazy because it yeah. feels like a long time. It also feels like a very short amount of time perspectives. <laughs> um, Remarkable. Yeah. Um, so getting back to the, the money question. So you, you know, you took these offers as they came to you and you, the way you put it was you didn't trust yourself enough to turn them down, yes. you know, and why would you, I mean, you know, again, um, but it it is a very, you know, uh, amazing insight to have that now. Um, so what what other opportunities came your way um, after that in terms of making money from doing your podcast, not doing someone else's podcast, but doing your own? Yeah. So a big moment for me was a couple of different sponsorships that happened in 2022, which was with My First Million, which was a podcast that I listened to and enjoyed and would tell my friends about and Sri Ram and Arthi's Good Time Show. Both of these shows separately came to me and was like, we love what you're doing. We believe in you and we would love to sponsor you. And that to me, that was huge validation for what I was doing, what I was building. And it was so exciting to get those, um, just to get paid for my work and to get paid for living my dream. Mm. And that that was very exciting for me. And those were two, two big moments for me that allowed me to like move out and allow me to come to Austin. And so, you know, Sam from my first million is a, a good friend and Sean's come on the podcast before and Sri Ram and Arthi, I interviewed them for episode 274 and they like, they loved the interview so much. And so they so, already, they had their own experiences of you as, as from a guest's perspective. And that no doubt is what, um, played a, probably a big part in their offering you a sponsorship, right? Definitely. Without a doubt. That that was that was the thing that pushed them over the edge. It wasn't like a traditional model of like CPMs or like how podcast advertising usually it's just like we believe in you and take <laughs> this money. You know, and just like if that's not a sign from God or whatever, like that to me, that's how I viewed it of just like, all right, this is this is the way we're supposed to go. And um 
that was great. And then I had, I started to do podcast consulting after that, where I started to help podcasters who were, who were just getting started, but had made money in one aspect of their life and transition over to podcasting or to add podcasting to their stack of things that they were doing and helping them start it and how to get guests and how to do research. And so that's what I was doing in more recently in, in 2023. And then I started saying the same things over and over again to so many different people said, I got to put all this in one resource. And that is, that's art of interviewing. So that's been the monetary journey. It's been, it's been ups and downs on it. You know, like it's been like, like debt and then, you know, paying it off and then debt again, paying it off and putting all of it back into the podcast because I believe in it. And then, you know, losing belief and then losing money and then gaining money. It's been like a roller coaster. Mm. But the whole time I have this peace about me uh, and about myself and about what I'm doing of like, oh, this is, there's not even a question. There's nothing else I'd rather do. There's not like, even if I'm in debt, even, if, but like, there's just a knowing. And so thankfully I'm not in debt anymore, but it's just like, I just feel like so at peace, even when I was in debt of like, there's nothing, there's nothing wrong here. Like this is right. So where did that peace come from? Especially in the, the difficult, the lows in that journey. One part of it is that I didn't have anyone else to support other than myself. Another part of it is just like understanding that it takes time and that I was putting in the time, energy, and effort into my craft and that I was getting better at my craft and I was investing in myself. And I I often would think about like, okay, a professional basketball player wouldn't expect to be a professional after three years of doing basketball. It would likely take him, you know, at least 10 years to be a professional and to play at a professional stage. And so even if you don't take that as the example, maybe it's like, like a lawyer, like they, it takes three years for them to get their degree. And so after that, then they could start practicing. And it's like only after those three or four years and passing the bar. So I'm like, I looked at my life like that and looked at podcasting like that. Like, have I really put in enough work to be a professional Mm. at this? And and I, I came back to that often when I was going into debt, similar to people would go into debt for school. I was like, I'm paying the price of admission right now of, of what I'm trying to accomplish. And it's, and it feels right because it's in alignment with the person I want to be and in alignment with my calling. So wow. that's kind of why I felt peace around it. That's beautiful. And I think with that, there's a word that you didn't use, but that immediately occurred to me, which is trust. Yes. So talk to me about trust. You can't, I can't talk to you about trust without talking about the surrender experiment by Michael Singer. (laughs) And it feels like just from looking at you and feeling your energy that you've read or you're familiar with the surrender experiment by Michael Singer. Yeah. uh, Actually, I don't know if I, uh, Untethered Soul, I read a long time ago. And the surrender experiment, I don't think I read, but I, I, I know of it. So, but for those who are unfamiliar, go. (laughs) Just, (laughs) it is my most gifted book. And, I, you mean that is, you give to others? Yes. Yeah. That I give to others. And hopefully one day when I have a podcast studio, I can have a whole section, a whole row of the surrender experiment so people could just take it if they want. Wow. And I got that idea from Andy Frisella, who has a similar library and he just, he's got all of his favorite books and you just pick it out and if you like it and you take it home and that's yours. That's so cool. Yeah. And the surrender experiment was this book by Michael Singer that details a guy's journey from meditating in the woods when he's, I think, starting at 18, 19, 20, around that age, to running WebMD or being a vice president of Hmm. WebMD, billion-dollar company. And the entire time, he just says to himself, I'm going to meditate and let life flow the way it is supposed to flow. And the surrender experiment is his autobiography of surrendering to the flow of life, surrendering to the calling, surrendering to the truth of the moment. And I've lived my life that way over the past three years since reading that book. It fundamentally changed me as a person. It made me realize the synchronicities, the things that happen that are unexplainable are right. They're supposed to be that way. Everything that happens is perfectly aligned if you let it be, if you trust that it is. And I've seen this time and time again, and it is why 
you know, I'll be stuck in traffic or I don't drive that much these days. But like if I was stuck in traffic, I would say to myself, this is where I'm supposed to be. This is supposed to be teaching me something. And I swear to you, it creates such a love for life. It creates such a joy. It creates a, oh, let's see how this will play out. Let's see how this incredible situation will play out. Let's see how this awful situation will play out. It may has made me an observer of my thoughts. And obviously this is in addition to meditation, which Michael Singer still to this day does an hour in the morning and an hour in the evening. And so to me, that was like, all right, if Michael Singer is doing this every day, like, and he's at this level, he's like 75 years old, I think, or around that age, still doing that. It's like, there's something there that like getting in touch with source, getting in touch with the energy really makes a difference. So that book is amazing. I can't say enough good things about it. Everybody should read it. It should be required reading. I wish I read it when I was younger. Uh, maybe Carpe Diem would have come to be sooner. And I'm very grateful for having that book. But like everything, it costs you when it's you're supposed to read it. So like everything. I, I love everything you shared and just as much the passion behind it. So thank you. Of course. It, it is the <laughs> truth. It is it is like the surrender experiment points to the truth of life. And I've experienced it firsthand. And it's why Gary Vaynerchuk comes on the show. I'm just like, surrender. Surrender to this experience. You know, um, other guests that are dream guests, they come on the show and it's like, this is the experience. Like, surrender to it. And um, I see it unfolding perfectly, just as it is supposed to, in perfect time. Why do you think it's so difficult for people to do that, to surrender to the moment and not try to um, like tightly control. Why, why is it so difficult for people to trust and surrender? Because we've been taught we can control our internal feelings with external circumstances. If you make this amount of money, you will be happy. If you have this amount of followers on social media, then you will be happy. If you have that car, you'll be happy. And we are marketed to show you that this is the case. Look at all these happy people in the commercial. They're happy. They, they've got an amazing car. And the car is the result. The car is what has given them the happiness. But that's the lie. And, and uh, the reason why we believe we can control our internal state with external things is because that's the lie we believed. But it is not actually true. And the surrender experiment shows you that it's not true. And meditation shows you it is not true. And going to Costa Rica, which my my friend did and just lived every day with nothing but yoga and waking up with the sunrise and going to sleep at sunset and having no connection to the internet, that that's all he need. He was like, that's all I need to be happy. And it's true. And it's really true. We We need a lot less to really feel internally peaceful than we think we do because we've been sold the lie that if we have these things, then we are going to be complete. That's the lie. And as much as you can recognize that, the more at peace and the more loving life and every moment you will be. Thank you. I, do, I enjoyed that. I enjoyed taking that in. Um, do you think it's possible to create a culture that offers a different message? And if so, how would it be economically viable? In other words, like consumerism is like you got to keep the economy going, right? Like yeah. people need to spend and buy. And so, of course, these messages are prolific and everywhere, and we're we're bombarded by them. And we're even if we think, oh, that doesn't affect me, you're wrong, <laughs> right? It just is. It's so you're you're the the environment is just like shaping you, wh whether you're aware of it or not. Um, and you can do certain things to to be intentional about it, but but I mean, it's you know, right, powerful and ultimately, per, all you know, pretty pervasive. So, yeah, two part question: Do you think it's possible to you know, um, put out a different message and create a different environment, large scale that is concerned about people's well-being instead of, um, you know, their wallets. And if so, would the world fall apart if that happened, if people realize, oh, I don't need very much at all to be happy? <laughs> I'm not sure. And I also want to, 
I I kind of punch down on consumerism in the the example. I actually also want to lift it up for mm. all of the amazing inventions that it's given us. It's given us the ability to connect right now in this moment, and it's given so it, it pushes us forward in a way. I love Joe Rogan's take on this of like we always just want better things that will never change. Like people will just want better stuff always. That like it'll be true and it was true in 1950 it'll, it'll be true in 2050 as well and i love that idea of like that being beneficial because we mm. want better things because we're never content in some sense it's leading us down the path of creating stuff that is actually better so that's that's one thing that i will say that i i do appreciate about the consumerist world that we live in um i just think like i think the balance is what i'm i'm aiming to put forward i'm not saying to stop the consumerism I'm saying, yeah, you think that will make you happy. Like still try to get it. Like still try to be rich and famous if that's what you desire. And see like maybe life isn't any different or life doesn't change. And we we just, we're too far on one end mm. of rich and fame for my vantage point in the United States at this time. This is what I've experienced. And it's like, we're too far down the road of like money will solve your problems. Fame will solve your problems. Like, let's go to the other side. If we were so on the side of like, life is peaceful, life is Zen, like every moment is perfect. I'd probably push the other way and be like, guys, guys, we gotta, we gotta like do some stuff here. <laughs> let's get it going. So I guess what I serve really is the balance. And that's what I try to do with the podcast too. In the, in the interviews, it's like, I want to balance the interaction. Oh, you're really peaceful. Are you ambitious? Oh, you're really ambitious. Are you peaceful? And try to give people that, that sense of equanimity. That I feel at least. Yeah. The golden mean balance, um, being and doing not yeah. just one or the other. Um, okay. So tell me about the decision to move to Austin. How long had that been brewing and what factored into it? Let's just, whatever you want to say about it. So Austin was something that I knew would lead me to the right place and w was the right place in maybe August of 2022. Like I just felt like this is where I'm supposed to be, but it wasn't, it might've been May of 2022 actually, <clears throat> but moving requires you to uproot your life. Even if you don't have children, even if you don't like, you have to explain to all these people why you're moving. And it's just like, Oh, like I, the, that part of the, the logistics gave me resistance. And I was like, Maybe it was just one good trip. So then I went again and I was like, oh, maybe it's just two good trips to Austin. Then I went again and it was three good trips. And I was like, all right, I'm moving. Like, that's it. Like if I have three experiences that each progressively get longer and every time leaves me feeling more joy and more peace, maybe this is a good idea to experience all of the time. And the reason why Austin, Texas attracted me so much is because every person that I've met here is working on something that is in alignment with the person they want to be. Wow. And that that is not true for every person in Austin, Texas, but every person that I've met really like that you that met spent, online or like oh. that I've met in person that I've spent a lot of time with. Okay. And, and so, yeah, it's a hyper, hyper, hyperbolic, 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 <laughs> hyperbolic statement. statement there. Yeah. yeah. It's a hyperbolic statement, but, but to me, it feels true. Like in Austin, people are so aligned with what they're working on and who they are. And they give a lot of thought to that. And for me, that is the most attractive type of person. That's the type of person I want to be around. That's the type of person I want to be. That where my work and what I'm, I'm, my soul's calling are in alignment. And I find that time and time again with so many different individuals and humans. So that's kind of the reason why I felt called to move here was because I felt that. And over the past 11 months, it's been that. It's been true. It's been real that the people who have moved here, who are here, are doing something different. Like they're they're more aligned. They're more connected to their purpose, to their mission. And it feels like the future is being built here. That's what I said when I, I stumbled across it. And that's what I still say today. So- and are, are these people, I already sort of can anticipate your answer, but, and these people perhaps are also connected with each other or to each other. Sometimes they are, and sometimes they're not. Sometimes okay. I'm the one that's been called to connect them. It's pretty remarkable. 
So yeah, sometimes these people aren't even aware of each other and wow. they're, they're all in a line. You know, they all and found what a gift to connect them. Yes. And I've realized that that is part of my calling or my pursuit that I didn't even realize was <laughs> right. That I'm, I'm the, now I'm the hub for so many different people and I'm the connection point. And what an amazing responsibility and a, and a, cause I love it. I love the, the mutual pre you win. I win. We all win. Everyone wins when people know each other. And it's been a, a remarkable thing to be able to be that center point for so many. I love it. And to have benefited, no doubt, from being connected, right? Like when you've benefited from that, uh, then it, you know, you, it's like natural for you to want to do the same uh, for others. I, ha I have some shop questions for you, talking shop here about podcasting, because you're the guy that I just have to ask these questions to. Uh, I mean this one sincerely. It may sound funny, but I, I really, I, I'm, this is a legitimate question. Okay. Explain to me how it is possible to maintain a schedule of releasing three episodes a week of your podcast when you, for each episode from as, as far as I can gather, like myself, you really put a lot into the research, the prep, and just all the steps. I mean, from, from the initial reach out to the person to maybe following up to scheduling, to preparing, studying them, doing the conversation remote or in person. And I want to ask you about the differences there as well. And um, and then all of the post work, it's a lot of work to do this well and to do it right and to do it the way you do it. How in the world do you keep up the that pace? Please explain. There. <laughs> The more you do, the easier it gets. That's one. Um, two is I've helped now for the first 300 episodes. I did it all myself, every piece of it. And after around episode 300, <clears throat> I started doing, I video King Pablo found his way into my life. And he did that by asking to be part of the show and help me out in some way. I hmm. said, you know, I get this message all the time. He proceeded to send me one vertical clip of the podcast every single day for no payment on his end. And I said, this guy is incredible. I cannot believe that he's doing this. I slowly gave up responsibility of editing the podcast and doing clips for the podcast and gave that to him because he loves it. He listens to it anyway, and he's the man and he's the best. And so my state of mission is to make Video King Pablo a millionaire. And I will do everything in my power to make him such. And that has helped a lot because that's the part of the, the episode that drained me the most. Yeah. All the other parts that you're talking about, connecting with the guests, researching them, learning about them, posting the episode, that to me is exciting. That to me is where the joy is. That to me is, is what lights me up. And so it's easier to do when you love every bit of it. And I've gotten better at knowing that I could do three hours of research on someone. And that could be the same as last year doing six hours on them because I know where to go mm. on the internet. I know how to research them more effectively. And so that is, that's played a key role as well. I wonder if Parkinson's law also is applicable here, how the work expands to fill the time available, right? So if totally. you have six guests booked in a concentrated period of time, that automatically limits the amount of hours that it's humanly possible to do your research on. So it, it gives you a container. It, it provides limits. And as you said, with with practice, you you get better at making the use of that time and doing the research effectively with less hours. Is that right? Yes, that's, that's absolutely the case. Like, I know that if I was doing one a week and then I transitioned to three a week, it would seem like a lot more work. But I know I would get it done. And sometimes I think about like, should I be doing five a week? You know, if I could do three. <laughs> I know this is sounds sickening to people, but I'm like, could I do it? Like, would it be possible? And I just, I brainstorm with myself. So, yeah. And then maybe. even if, even if it's possible, then the question is, is it, is it worth it? Like just right. because you can, doesn't mean you should, right? Like, right. Um, you don't want to burn out. Yes. But also it's like, it gives me joy. 
So it's like, <laughs> right. <laughs> so I, I don't know. Give yourself more joy. So I, I think about that. And I think about like, there are, are TV hosts who do five days a week. You know, there are like, it's not that crazy. Obviously they have production and stuff like that, but I don't know. I, I just think like we underestimate our capabilities yeah. as humans all the time. And well, um, I want to expand that instead of, I want to argue for where I want to be, not argue for my limitations. Oh, it's so beautiful. And I want to just give you a shout out because you have for sure, I, I you know, I make no promises here on this podcast uh, at this moment in time at all. Um, but you have at least planted the idea in my brain that such a thing is even possible. I would never have believed it. I'm serious. I would never have believed it was it was even possible to do anything re- close to the pace that you have done and sustained. And you've, I've met you at least virtually, and you do not seem to me to be an AI. You do seem to be human. I, I don't. I haven't seen you in all three dimensions, but like it's like oh okay. And and I love, I love people that completely shatter our beliefs about what's possible and not that they that I've always that's just always been something that I'm I'm uh, appreciative of um, what in whatever domain just people who just show you that the what you thought was the limit is nowhere near the limit and then because they just give you they expand your own sense of what you can do so you've done that for me so I thank you for that I I appreciate you saying that thank you yeah um, okay, more podcast related questions. Is it possible to do too much research? Mm, I, I think so. Um, but I I think so only to the extent that you do too much and and disregard your own presence. The yeah. reason why I the reason why I love this podcast so much is because you've obviously done a lot of homework on me, but that hasn't stopped you from asking thoughtful follow-up questions or from really being present to the creation of what we're doing here. And because of that, like no, I don't think there's too much research you can do if you are able to sit in whatever it is and be able to add and follow up. Otherwise, yeah. It, but but for me, when I started out, I would do the research, but then I would drop the presence and the presence wasn't there. And because of that, I couldn't have a great episode from my perspective. So does that answer the question? Yeah, I think it's a, it's a balance uh, between... You know, being I think being prepared is is beneficial, hugely beneficial. Whether you get to a third of your questions or or whatever, because it's it just informs everything. And you're right, you can't you don't want it to be at the expense of of ultimately the you have to be um you have to be present to the conversation itself, which is going to have have a life of its own, and you and you have to be willing to go where it goes, and uh, and certainly. there's nothing that's more frustrating for me as a listener to an interview. You know where I'm going. You already know what I'm going to say. Nothing in the world where you hear a guest drop gold, like they drop something that you're like, "Oh my god, I want to hear an hour more about that." Like, and the and then the interviewer says, "So moving on," and you're like, "You, you have got to be kidding me. You have got I, to be kidding." Me. I scream. I scream out loud when that happens. <laughs> like genuinely scream. So I, I strongly relate and being in this seat you are in for 35 episodes, like you, you understand like the power you hold to navigate the conversation. And I, I do get upset. You know, I, I talk about the traffic, you know, not, not annoying me, but that is, is one thing that gets under my nerves. (laughs) Meditation hasn't, hasn't uh, gotten that out of you yet or hasn't. uh, Yeah. Um, (laughs) One day. One day, yeah. Well, you know, it's it's motivation to keep doing it. Um, you've done four hundred plus interviews or so, mm-hmm. and um, I know from having done like thirty five, I know, and but doing them with the sort of similar, um, let's call it seriousness, for you know, taking it seriously, um, that you learn a ton. I mean, like the learning is is just through the roof in terms of people's ideas. Uh, I mean, it's, it's, it's incredible. I mean, it's, it's a sta- it's, it's an incredible education, just researching and doing interviews. Um, my question for you though, is what have you learned, not just content wise from your guests, what they share with in their, in your interviews with them and from the prep and research that you do, but what have you learned just through the process from start to finish, from reaching out 
to desired guests and observing the way your guests behave throughout from the time you've reached out to them till you know and be till it's done and beyond what have you learned about people about life and about yourself from having done all those interviews so many things <laughs> like a, a ridiculous amount of things which oh <laughs> it's such such a large question and so great so great um the first thing that came to mind was that everyone every guest respects something different meaning some guests respect the amount of episodes that you put out other guests respect that you have a youtube following of over 10,000 subscribers other guests respect that you have this amount of downloads other guests respect that someone they respect was on that show mm. so it's interesting seeing the ways in which people's behavior changes based on what they respect. And you get an inside look at the things that they respect based on when they respond or why they respond to your inquiry messages. That's one thing. But about myself, what I've learned is like, I've gotten so much better at asking questions and, and being a conduit for people to see themselves as they truly are. And this is like the most impactful thing that I can, like, this is why it is winning. Even if I, no one watches the podcast, because you cannot take the podcast out of me. It is with me wherever I go. I am so comfortable in my own skin, in whatever situation you place me in, that it's almost crazy to me when I look back on that episode that I did with Gary Vaynerchuk, because I thought I was comfortable with myself then. And I'm like, oh my God, this is a different person. And doing the episode, doing 39 was impactful to get me to that place, but doing all of them in person and doing all of them on camera and filming and just being who I am, I feel so good in every moment. And I feel so good presenting myself as a mirror for someone else to see themselves as they truly are in every moment. So that's uh, that's kind of what I've taken away from the podcast. No big deal or anything, right? Wow. And and that speaks to what Gary said to you about how the process itself makes it more worth it than anything like just in and of itself, regardless of, you know, just what you get from from doing it, right? Exactly uh, right. Uh, I love that answer. And real quick to the point about remote versus in-person interviews, because let's face it, it's a massive difference in cost and logistics mm -hmm. and and you've tried you've gone out you've taken like you've flown yourself out to like all kinds of places hence get... why i've gone into debt <laughs> 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 and to, so to worth it so Permit. yeah so tell me why it's worth it so i'll never forget when morgan housel one of my favorite writers and someone who really inspires me and i'm guessing inspires you too just based on on liking Derek Sivers. If you like Derek Sivers, you might like Morgan Housel and two people I, who are- I yeah. loved your interviews with both of them, by the way. They were both astounding. I just want to also, for whatever it's worth, in case people care about my opinions about anything, um, there were there were some interviews in- I mean, like you do a tremendous job and I'm not always like, you know, I'm, I'm not nearly as passionate about some guests as others, but- you're consistent in the way you show up for the interviews, in the way you conduct yourself. It's is always impressive to me. But there are some interviews that uh, that just blow me. This is of yours that just blew me away. And I will just name some of them in case people want to go to check those out as you know, to start with. Uh, but I also want to hear where you would point people to. But some of the ones like that are stand or stand out to me. Your interview with Brian Johnson mm. was. Stunning. It was stunning. Now I knew who he was and I had seen Stephen Bartlett interview him on Diary of a CEO. And that was incredible. And that helped inform, like the more you know about a guest uh, going into an episode, but what you brought out of him and the space you, you, you created for him, I was, I was like, my jaw was just on the floor. I was like, wow, wow. Um, some of my other, the, the, the job you did with Derek Sivers is what connected us in the first place. And I was just blown away. Um, the way you, the, the interview you did with Morgan Housel was incredible. And one of my, two of my favorites, because you had him on twice was David Senra, whom I previously knew nothing at all about. And um, so 
you know, it's just a, so thank you just for introducing me to the people I didn't know about and for giving me these just joyous uh, moments as a fan of podcasts, um, of watching an interviewer draw out gold from the interviewee. And in the, the, the two specific ways that I've observed that in which you do that, the first is just really thoughtful questions. And then the second is after you've asked the question, you just give them the space and you're like, it's like, you're gone. Like, like when you come back to ask the question, it's like, Oh, I forgot he was here. Like, and that's really difficult to do. So I, again, with great respect and admiration, salute you on that. Um, yeah. So, okay. I'm, Remote versus in person. You were going to tell me about the benefits of in person. I, I, if well, I interrupted. No, I appreciate the interruption so much, and I love all the conversations and interviews you mentioned. The reason why I brought up Morgan Housel mm -hmm. was because in episode two ninety nine, afterwards he said, "You know, after you started doing them in person, I started to take your show more seriously." Wow. And that to me was like that's what Morgan Housel respects, right? Like. That's a clear show of this makes a difference for him as the viewer, because what does it signal to him? It says this person cares enough to rent out a studio. This person cares enough and believes in them, themselves enough to get the guest to the studio. And it increases the production quality. And so, I mean, besides all the obvious things that that was going to get me an interview with Morgan Housel, I didn't know that. Whom, ironically enough, you did remotely. You did that one. <laughs> yes, exactly. That's exactly right. But And I offered to go to Seattle to fly to him because I love Morgan Housel. And I'm like, I would go on a plane, you know, whatever. But the the point is that it's just, it was so interesting to hear that was the reason why. Right. And, and so how many guests have I gotten because of doing them in person that otherwise don't even realize that's why they're coming on? because they appreciate how much work I put into it and how much I believe in my own mission. I believe in my own podcast that it, it's an interesting thing for me to note and for other people to note as well. Yes, it costs more. Yes, it, it can be more difficult to actually do. And there are podcast studios popping up, but there's not that many of them overall across the country. But yet, uh, to, yet exactly. It's, I think it's going to be a, a huge mainstay thing. It's uh, it's incredible, and and so to me that was the biggest difference between doing them remotely and in person was just how much people respected the difference mm. of me putting effort into booking a studio and and doing them in person. Fascinating, um, because from from my again for whatever it's worth from my vantage point, it doesn't matter as to me viewing them. Like I loved the first interview with David Senra that was done remotely just as much as I loved the one you did in person with him in Miami. So, wow. yeah. Uh, so, I mean, again, like, and that's not to just to say you shouldn't do them in person. I'm just, I've made me very curious. Like, what is it that's the draw for Danny to do them in person when it's just, you know, a million times easier to do them remotely? Um, okay. Um, here's a question that I like. I'm just really interested to see what you have to say. What is the difference to you between a conversation and an interview? For me, conversations are, are dialogues, they're back and forths, and interviews are, for the purpose of this conversation, I am more interested in you than me. So I think that's the difference, and that's what I attempt to do to gain the nuggets of wisdom from the other person to help the audience out by learning about this person's mind. It's like, I'm interested in you. I want to learn about you. And that's what denotes an interview for me. What do you think? Yeah, I will. I will answer that. Um, I agree. I think that generally like that is the definition, right? Like a conversation is much more two way and an interview is, is more focused on the interviewee. Like, I guess the real question becomes is what makes for the best podcast and, um, I've seen it. I think it's, I've seen it done well, both ways, you know, 
And I really appreciate, like there are times when the host shares something that's to the benefit of the conversation and the audience and the guest, because the guest, it then like gives them permission to open up more about something, but it has to be done really carefully and selectively and skillfully because the focus really should be on the guest if it's an interview format show. But I, but I do think there are times, and so I don't know how, I honestly can't evaluate myself on this. I know that I, it, it varies interview to interview, but in some interviews, I will share personal stories or anecdotes that I feel are relevant and purposeful and that, you know, like help the conversation. But I always question it and question myself about it. And I, and I make the effort to, um, do less of that or be very selective about it. But I have seen it done where it's so effectively that I know it's potentially helpful. Absolutely. And I, I think whatever you do is right because you have so much of a focus and intention on the other person. I don't know if they're all like this, but it's like, I feel like you're so far in one direction and it's amazing in one direction, the what you've done, but also like, However much you pull back and you focus on yourself or you insert yourself is probably going to be minuscule, but in your head, it's magnified. Is yeah, what I would imagine a, based on a, what you, you've said. Yeah. And it's a, it's, a, it's a danger because when you observe people who go overboard, it's the worst. Right. I, I don't think you're capable of going overboard. <laughs> you don't know me yet very well, but <laughs> <laughs> believe me, I'm I'm capable of it. But I've probably <laughs> at your age, I don't think I could have um, done it skillfully. Mm -hmm. um, maybe now I can. Maybe. Um, all right. Um, you told Chris Bussing to bring him back into the conversation. Um, you said to him something in your in your in the interview he did with you that I thought was really cool and interesting and worth following up on, and that was that. You said, I'm more of a therapist than a podcaster. Yes. Uh, tell me more about that. <laughs> Absolutely. B didn't we mention Chris Bussing before about what I said about meditation? Yeah. Mm -hmm. What did I say about meditation? So at the very end of the conversation with him, he basically pulled a Danny Miranda and said, um, what's a challenge you have for the listeners uh, to take with them from our conversation. And you basically gave a pitch to the value of meditation. And I was like, that's the best sales pitch I've ever, like, you know, if meditation were a product, get this guy, put that in a commercial. <laughs> like it was, I was like, wow, because I don't, and I, so I couldn't repeat exactly what you said, but it was just like, it was succinct enough, but really, really impactful enough. You, you spoke to how profound the profound change in yourself, the profound impact it had on you. And it was just, you know, I don't, I don't know. So it, it, it was just um, very effective. So go revisit it and see what you said. <laughs> I'm, <laughs> I'm going to, I'm yeah. going to, I appreciate that. Uh, and I'm going to make a clip out of that if we can. Yeah, on, you should. On, on meditation. But to answer your question about being a therapist more than a podcast, that's how I feel. I feel like I'm helping people understand themselves better. I feel like I'm lighting up their soul and, figuring out the places in which they might be blocked or stuck in some way and helping them get to the next thing that they they feel like in their heart they should be doing and figuring out why they're not doing X, Y, or Z if needed. And I feel like I'm I'm really uncovering them and and helping them better understand themselves. Like you've done for me in this episode. Wow. Like I, I really do better understand myself. Like there are things in here that I I forgot about myself where and that that is such a remarkable feeling to get a better understanding of yourself as a result of spending time with someone. And that's what a good therapist will do, I I imagine. Um, and, and, a so good that, and a good friend. Exactly. And a good friend as well. So it's just rare that it's so thoughtful. And so like a, a friend will be so one-sided to uncover each part of your life and, and bring those to you in a way. It, it's usually just one comment or it's one perspective. And it's rare that it's like, it's so thoughtful in terms of a friend, for at least from my experience. And I have some mm -hmm. amazing friends. But uh, yeah, that's why I view myself as a therapist. This is another fun question. This is what I call the Dr. Frankenstein question. Um, so if you could reboot yourself tomorrow 
Like, let's say you go to sleep and then Dr. Frankenstein comes in <laughs> and does some work on you overnight. But, you you know, this is all based on your requests. And, um, and you could patch together the qualities you most admire from, um, from the people that you admire into one patchwork so that when you woke up as Danny monster <laughs> tomorrow, um, you know, what would, what would he look like? This is such a great question. I might have to steal this <laughs> Frankenstein question. Um, I'm just writing it down. <laughs> I, I would say that I am so content with the body and mind I've been given, mm. but I always wished I was more athletic. And this, this goes to the piece about like covering sports at a young age and mm. covering the Knicks and, and writing on my, my high school paper is like, I always just wish I was more involved in the world of athletics. And that's why I'm, I'm running a marathon, but like I'm running the marathon. I'm like, I'm slow. Like, and I know I'm slow based on like Who the cares? data and it doesn't matter at all, yeah. but if it, and I, I don't lose any sleep over it, Yeah. but I will say that if given the opportunity to change yeah. something about myself, I'm going to make myself more athletic. Okay. So. And any, any, you know, people in, in particular that you would like pull from specifically mm. and, and in, cause athletic is a broad term, right? You, yes. there's lots of so I mean, I just make myself ninety nine on strength, ninety nine on speed, ninety nine on yeah agility, like all of the night. Like why not just max that out? Yeah. Uh, we'll add you know six inches, like a height, <laughs> right. like yeah, you know. Yeah. So I, but the truth is, like I'm very, I'm so grateful with the hand and the like. I feel like, I feel like I got this perfect mix of being like like smart enough to understand some things about the world, but also dumb enough not to know what the smart people know, like the really smart people yeah. know. And so <laughs> I maintain a level of like youthful exuberance because I can't possibly comprehend some of the stuff that like the smartest people in the world are talking about. And in I'm, the Brian like, jo- I'm sorry to interrupt, but in the Brian no. Johnson interview, you you basically said at the end, like that he he blew your mind, like he blew your the fuse. I don't remember the words you used, but like he broke your brain a couple of times. <laughs> totally, totally. And I'm like, I'm smart enough to know Brian Johnson's smart, but not smart enough to understand his ideas. Like to me, that's like the, ever, like that perfect IQ spot or that perfect place in the world for me is like that. Mm-hmm. And so- like I just feel so grateful for so many of my attributes that I wasn't, I didn't choose and that were just given to me. So. Okay. A few more questions if you have the time. Um, so in uh, David Perel's interview with you, episode 305, this is a great Danny Miranda quote. You said, maybe a life well lived is just worshiping the present moment. Hmm. Right? Good stuff. Who said that? <laughs> you said that. I appreciate so, that. So the question attached to that, I'm going to phrase it in a, in like three different ways. How do you personally manage or balance the tension between be wanting to be present-oriented and future-oriented? Two other ways of saying that would be um, being grateful for what you have with the goals and desires for what you want. Mm-hmm. Uh, or pushing yourself versus accepting yourself. Yeah, this is the fundamental question of everyone, whether they realize it or not. Um, and <laughs> it's it's something that you you constantly have to ask yourself, like, am I living in the future? Am I living in the present? Am I living too much in the present? Am I living too much in the future? Um, how do you worship the present moment better? Well, I think it a big part of this is understanding where you are generally living and where the your culture is generally living. Hmm. Our culture is generally living in one of future orientation, right? So because of that, my natural inclination, not, not my natural inclination, but my inclination is to push back on that. Is like, okay, if we're all thinking about the future, like, can we think more about the present? And if we're thinking so much about the present, like, let's think about what, like, we can't get eaten here. Like, let's, you know, like we're, if we're in a tribe and we're thinking about, so 
I think that it, it's a balance like anything. And it, I think it comes down to what is your culture saying you should focus on? And then ask yourself, how do you, how do you cultivate the other one a little more? And for a lot of people listening to this, I imagine it is they're thinking too much about the future. So start meditating or start journaling or start taking a walk without your phone and be more present oriented because your culture is telling you to look into the future. That's a great answer. I like that a lot. It reminds me of the the spectrum, right? Like, you know, and you were where we were talking about commercialism versus like peace, you know, and 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 internal peace, right? And that there's pay attention to what um the dominating message is that that you're taking in and make sure you balance that out. Yeah, that's a great answer. So here's a here's another um uh, Danny Miranda quote from episode 371 with David Senra, whom I already mentioned, who does the Founders podcast, which I still haven't yet had time to explore. I can't wait because oh. just listen, just listening to him on your podcast made me go, oh, I have to listen to this. Like he's just, oh, man. <laughs> so, yeah. So in that in that episode, you said to him a different variation on, on the first quote I just um brought up. You said to David Perel, I'm sorry, to David Senra, also a David, maybe the sign of a life well lived is just having conversations with people you're excited to talk to. That's a good one. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you agree. I mean, you agree, right? Yeah, I would say so. I mean, if you really analyze the lives of people who were really successful. I mean, how many of those people were having conversations with mm. people that they actually enjoyed talking to? I would venture to guess all of them in my estimation. And not, that's not to say that every conversation they have is going to be with someone they enjoy talking to, but I would venture to guess a large percentage of their time was talking to people they were excited to talk to. I'm going to say, and, I'm going to interject please, something if you don't please, mind. Um, please, it's going to sound hopelessly sentimental and whatever. However, it sounds I don't care. <laughs> okay. Um, if you marry the right person for you, not that there's only one, but you know what I mean by that. Mm -hmm. um, then you get to have a conversation with someone you're excited to talk to every day, yeah. and that's how I feel about the person I'm that I've married that I'm with. Yeah, I, and you could feel that in you and. Another thing that my friend Dylan and I have talked about a lot is like, would you start a podcast with your wife? We're we're both single. And we we say this as a test, a litmus test for how much we would enjoy talking to someone in a relationship. And it's so true. And so that to me is, is like, how, how can you live a life that you're excited about if that's not true? If the person you spend the most time yeah. with isn't someone you're excited to talk to. And you can understand why people go to like dark places because they don't have that. Yeah. Right. They don't, they don't have uh, their conversations aren't filled with joy and the person they're talking to, they're not excited to talk to. And because of that, they retreat into, into bad places. So yeah, it's so true. It's so real. And that's the number one, most important decision in my life. And I hope that doing the podcast has allowed me to become the type of person mm -hmm. who is capable of attracting the type of person that I want to, to spend the majority of my time with. And how lucky they will be to be able to talk to you every day, talk with you every day. Yeah. Okay. Two more questions and then I will, I promise I will let you go on with your life. <laughs> this might be my longest podcast episode ever <laughs> as a guest or as a host. <laughs> um, hopefully that's a good thing. It is. Okay. You know, you like to end your interviews with a challenge for the listeners based on the conversation that was just had. So what would be your challenge to the listeners of this episode, specifically with regard to becoming the person they want to be? I would say analyze your childhood and ask yourself in which ways am I currently living in alignment with my childhood 
that excites me or that that could excite me. That's for someone who doesn't feel like they're in their calling or they're in their the thing that they want to be doing for a long time. And then if you are in your calling and you are making great steps to be the person you want to be, I would say love more because loving more helps connect human beings. It helps ignite other people's passions and pursuits and gives them a, a sprinkle of hope for what is possible. So either analyze your childhood if you're not the person you want to be and figure out the places that gave you the most joy as a child. Or if you are in the place you want to be and you are the person you want to be, then love. Love as many people as you can. Continue to pour into people. Continue to to just give your heart to others in uh, in the best way you possibly can. Those are my two challenges. Beautiful. And then the final question is, what about a challenge for yourself? Great question. Challenge for myself. I mean, I'm challenging myself right now to run a, a three hour, 30 minute marathon. Um, that's been the challenge that's come to mind because it's given me so much by way of spiritually connecting me with my body and connecting me with nature. And, you know, I'm, but if you, if you remove that, you know, the physical aspect of it, um, I challenge myself to, to keep doing what I'm doing. <laughs> you know, like I, I've gotten so much over the past three years and I've had periods which we've talked about of like belief, not belief and coming back to believe. And, and uh, like there's been see ebbs and flows and I, I would like to challenge myself to flow and to surrender to life and to surrender to the gifts that I've been given. And um, yeah, I appreciate the challenge for myself. I appreciate the thoughtfulness of this interview that it's been incredible to be on the side of the mic with you, especially you're really talented. You're really special at this. I, I can't believe you haven't gotten into meditation because it, this has been a meditation and it speaks to your presence, your ability to sit with silence, your ability to ask thoughtful questions, to come prepared. Like this was a plus incredible, incredible wow. job. And I really mean it from the bottom of my heart. I'm so happy that we did this. Um, coming from you, Danny, that is, that means quite a lot. I'm honored and thrilled to be able to do this. My goal was to try to give you a similar experience to the one that you give your guests, mm -hmm. you know, with my own little sort of my own version of it, because we're yeah. all unique. Um, that was that was what I was aiming for. So you succeeded. <laughs> awesome. That's awesome to hear that. That's great. So where where would you direct people to uh, experience more of you? obviously your podcast, but point to all the places and let's not forget the course that you recently put out into the world. Yeah. I think the best place to reach me or contact me, if you made it this far in the episode, I'd love <laughs> to hear from you. I'd love to, you send me a DM on Twitter is probably the best place uh, to contact me. And that's, Hey, Danny Miranda. I recently put out a course, artofinterviewing.com. I basically have studied interviewing for 3,000 hours, and I've put it all in one resource for people to check out. I can guarantee you, Eric does not need to go through this resource. He has mastered the art of interviewing. After somehow just 35 episodes, that is a whole question in and of itself. How has he done this? This is incredible. Go look at episode 35 of my own podcast or episode 39 with Gary Vee, and you will see that it is nothing like what we just experienced here today. Incredible, incredible job, my man. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, the Danny Miranda podcast, if you would like some more of this. And I recommend, you know, if you're into stuff like this, Deep Thoughtful, Derek Sivers and Morgan Housel are great places to start, which uh, we're in the 200s, but uh, now we're up to episode 414. And it's incredible because it feels like it's getting better and better, deeper and deeper. And I love that. And so I'm excited to have both those people back on the show and can't wait to see the new unfoldings of the lessons we, we pull from them. But uh, I'm so grateful for this experience and thank you for the wisdom, the questions, everything. I'm I'm blown away. I appreciate you. Thanks, Danny. I, I it goes both ways. Thank you so much.